Good morning, everyone. I'd like to call the Santa Cruz March 24th Metro Transit District meeting to order. It's really nice to be here in person with you all this morning, and it's not dumping rain on all of us. So welcome. Um, I'll move on to agenda item number two, which is safety announcement by Curtis Moses. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Ms. Donna Bauer to do a roll call, please. Uh, Director Brown. Here. Director Downey. Director Dutra. Uh, Director Colin Perry Johnson. Here. Director Coney. Here. Director Lynn. Here. Director McPherson. Here. Director Newsom. Present. Director Kaper. Here. Director Quiros Carter. Quiros, uh, yeah, here. Here. Uh, Director Rockin. Here. Ex officio Director Henderson. Ex officio Director Marcel. Great, thank you. So we will now recess to the Santa Cruz Civic Improvement Corporation annual meeting and I'll pass it on to Director Rockin. So I'm going to quickly explain what this is. Um, in order to get loans uh, floated or bonds more importantly, uh, it's necessary to have some kind of a, a nonprofit agency that is not the transit district as a way to transfer the money from the federal government over to us. It's quite bizarre, but um, that's the way it works in, in the big Wall Street banks and, and um, floating these bonds. And so we created this group, the Santa Cruz Community uh, Civic uh, uh, Group, and uh, that's the reason the group got created. Um, when we were actually uh, floating a bond for the transit district in the 1980s, we got to get a lunch out of it, but I'm gonna, mostly it's a pretty uh, inactive group, in which case we don't serve anybody lunch because we're not doing anything. Um, that's what that group is for, and we, we keep that in reserve. It costs a fair amount of money to set that group up, the cost of the corporation and some other kinds of things. So rather than sunset it when we were done, we kept it alive for future possibilities of floating bonds for the agency. That's why it's here. Thank you. We'll go to um, Director McPherson. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to announce and uh, acknowledge the appointment uh, of Metro Board of Directors to serve on the SEC IC uh, off board officers due to five directors having been termed out uh, or vacated their positions on that board. The following board members were appointed to the Metro Board of Directors February 24th, 2023 meeting to serve the following positions on the SCCIC Board of Directors. Bruce McPherson, President, Director Colin Terry Johnson, Vice President, Director Koenig, Secretary, Director Pegler, Treasurer, and Director Downing as a member of that uh, the four positions will serve an additional two-year term to March 25th, and one position will complete a term vacated to March 24th, as highlighted on the attachment A. And, and I understand it does not take a vote to, uh, we don't need a motion or vote to make that approval. It's simply based on the appointments made that already been made. Thank you. Are we done with that meeting? We're not. Can I have a roll call of the uh, SCCIC? Uh, Director McPherson. Here. Director Colin Perry Johnson. Here. Director Coney. Here. Director Kaper. Here. Director Downey. So, so we're going to need a motion. We need to. Is there anybody in the public that would like to address this? 
said there's no bond activity that we anticipate at this point. Okay. Um, with that, uh, sorry, I just, uh, I, I would just call to um, adjourn the meeting of the SCCIC. We need to, uh, additions to the, or deletion to the agenda for sure. Oh, uh, none. Sorry. Okay, uh, then approve the prior year minutes of March 25th, 2022. Like to we approve those? Second. Oh. All the roll call. All right, Mr. Hagler. Number seven is the acceptance of the financial statement for the fiscal year 22, which is attachment C. Are there any questions by the board members? Any questions from the public? Move a motion to accept the uh, financial statement for fiscal year 22. Move approval. I'll second. We will now adjourn to the next uh, SCCIC Board of Directors meeting. Uh, I don't know exactly what date that date will be, but uh, we'll let you know. Thank you. Excuse me for saying that. Okay, we will reconvene the uh, Metro District Board meeting, and I'll move on to announcements. Today's meeting is being broadcast by Community Television of Santa Cruz County. Uh, we had uh, planned on having Spanish interpretation, and due to unforeseen circumstances, we had a last-minute cancellation, so we will not be able to provide that today, unfortunately. And <clears throat> we're fortunate to be able to participate, have hybrid participation. So if you're participating online, please mute yourself so we can um, minimize background noise. Any other announcements we're missing? Okay. I'll move on to agenda item seven for board of director comments. Any board members have comments? Director uh, Good morning. I just wanted to uh, thank all of the staff that have been working hard during this storm. Um, I know in your support, it's pretty amazing that you have COVID, you have fires, now you have this. And uh, I think it's just phenomenal that you just keep getting there every day, even when things are really not good. And I know the pressure is on, so. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do is thank John for hosting the uh, reimagining meeting this week. It didn't go quite as planned, but because of that, I think there were people there that spoke about things that were important to hear that might not have been there if the meeting hadn't gone on. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Mr. Koenig. Thank you, Chair. I want to report that last Wednesday I had the opportunity to go up to Sacramento as part of the Central Coast Coalition. That day we talked, um, so there's representatives from all the way down to Santa Barbara County, San Luis Obispo County, Monterey County, San Benito County, uh, and then down south with Santa Cruz County. Talked to a number of state representatives um, about common transportation projects that would benefit the Central Coast region. It's exciting to hear that our representatives in the Assembly and Senate are forming a Central Coast Coalition to have a little bit more voice up against the folks in LA and the Bay Area. Um, probably the most notable meeting for this agency was a chance to get in front of Under Secretary Mark Tolleson um, and talk about the advantages of the proposal we have for the transit and inner city rail capital program grant called TERSIP. Um, TERSIP basically has applied for a grant that would fund a number of hydrogen buses as well as the hydrogen fueling stations. So he said he understood the advantages of investing in smaller urban areas like ours where there's a possibility for a significant change in the way that people get around. I'm hopeful that that does happen. Anything else? And I just wanted to um, thank I was 
really proud of the response from Metro and of um, Ronald Fernandez Rodas in coming back to work after you know, getting his family out of the safety from their home in Sapporo and still coming back to, to be able to drive for Veracruz and the response from the Metro staff and employees that raised the funds to help him. I just read that article in the Sentinel and uh, just threw it to everybody. I mean, it just reminds us of the dedication of our drivers, but also the staff to be there to support those in the roads that are struggling right now. So thank you all. Director Victor. <coughs> yeah. Thank you. I want to just thank the staff and uh, the administration of uh, Metro just for getting ahead of so many issues, offering the rides, the share of the rides. It's a great, great meeting at uh, the museum part of history not too long ago. But in this uh, day and age of electric vehicles and going to electric buses, I am very proud to announce that on Tuesday, three to two vote, the county of uh, San Luis Obispo decided to join Central Coast Community Energy. Mm. Um, now we have the seven cities in the uh, county of, of uh, San Luis Obispo as well as the county. So we have the whole county. And now uh, in that Triple CE, we have 35 agencies that are participating and having us have a cleaner environment. And, uh, it was a rough whole go. We went down there two weeks ago to get it on the agenda, and uh, we worked uh, to get that three to two vote. And it's uh, very, very pleasing. It's going to be a really good thing for this whole region. Other directors? I'll take a moment and also echo my colleagues' um, comments that I want to acknowledge and thank the staff and the drivers for the work that you did over the storms over the last couple of weeks, um, really going above and beyond and um, showing the community that we are more than providing bus transportation. We are critical to public health, public safety in times of crisis and um, at any time. So just thank you so much for the work that you did in helping our community. Okay, we will move on to agenda item eight, which is oral and written communications to the board. Um, so this is a time set aside for directors and members of general public to address any item not on the agenda, which is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. So I will first go to um, members here in person to see if there's any oral communication. I don't see any, and I will now look to those participating virtually. If you'd like to uh, comment right now at oral communication, please raise your hand. Okay, I don't see any hands raised. I'll give it another. Oh, I don't see that. Okay. Hi, this is... Uh Right. Oh, oh, that's why. I was looking to the right. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, I know. So please, you, uh, you want me to are talk? Are we good? Ready to go? Okay, please go ahead, Mr. Peoples. Hey, this is Brian Peoples from Trail Now. I'm going to mention my favorite subject, which is the Coast Santa Cruz Coastal Trail. Uh, the North Coast Trail that goes from Wilder to Davenport has been delayed for years because uh, it goes along the coast, and the Coastal Commission has placed major restrictions. Actually, they only allow a temporary retaining wall for the trail. And so for this reason, it's been delayed and we actually don't have enough money now likely to build it. Um, when we look at the entire coastal corridor from Watsonville to Davenport, there are many locations that the trail or the rail line goes within 20 feet of the, of the coast. And uh, also it goes through the federally protected Harkin Slough, which is actually underwater right now. So what the issue is, is that the idea that we're going to have a, a electric, a new electric train 20 feet from the coastline is not realistic. And what that's happening is it's preventing our trail from being built. There's actually even no plan to build the trail to Watsonville. Watsonville is actually the, probably the community that is most penalized by this because they will never have a trail because the, the train advocates are trying to believe that they'll have a train, but there, there will, what we've seen with the North Coast Trail is evidence that the Coastal Commission will not allow it. Think about it. Everybody envisioned 
um, Manresa Beach where the tracks are. It's 20 feet or Park Avenue in Capitola along that cliff. The idea of having a spending a billion dollars for a train, 60 trains a day going past that. Now, many people think that the public wants a trail and are a train and we're going to give it to them. Well, unfortunately, you can't give it to them on the coastal corridor because it's 20 feet from the tracks. And what that's doing is it's preventing our trail from being built. We've only built 1.2 miles of the trail over the decade. And actually it's cost more than widening the highway. Building a 12 foot wide trail that costs more than widening the highway doesn't make a lot of sense. So I wanna encourage everybody to start being realistic on what we can and can't do because we're not getting it done. We're not getting the trail built. Watsonville, you're not getting the train. Widen the highway, that's the path forward. So I appreciate your everybody's time and I want everybody to just start to have that realization that you're never gonna have a train and it's preventing our trail from being built. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Let me ask a um, logistics question. Is, is there a timer on for speakers? Okay, I can't see it on my screen. Okay, thank you. Are there any other members uh, participating virtually that would like to speak for oral communication? Anyone seeing what I'm seeing? No hands up? Okay. All right, we'll move on to uh, labor organization communication. Hello? Okay, there we go. Good morning, Board of Directors. Uh, it's good to be in person again. I really missed this. Um, for everyone online that doesn't know who I am, my name is James Seneval. I'm the general chairperson of Smart Local 23, who represents the bus and paratransit operators here at Metro. And first, I want to say congratulations to uh, Shebra and Kristen on your appointments as chair and vice chair. Um, it's going to be great working with you guys to make sure we, you know, uh, get Metro where it needs to be. And I also want to thank Scott and Vanessa for meeting with me. Um, it's great to know you guys a little bit better and making sure that I have a relationship with each and every board member here that we're all, you know, continuously working together to make Metro a better place. And um, I just want to um, mention that uh, negotiations are coming up. Our first date for negotiations is April 6th and April 7th. And I just wanted to say that uh, it's been a great change uh, for the past year working with Michael Tree. We've been spending a lot more energy working together um, instead of fighting against each other. Um, I'm hoping that this negotiations will be uh, a smooth one. I will say the last one for the board members that were here could remember it was a pretty rough one. So um, I'm hoping that we could reach a deal that would help us better recruit and help better retain uh, the operators that we currently have. Um, so with that being said, um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, um, moving to item 10, additional documentation to support existing agenda items. I may have missed that, okay, thank you. So we are now moving to consent agenda, which is item 11.1 to 11.7. I'll look to directors to see if there are any comments or questions or if any item needs to be pulled. I would suggest that we pull item 11.7, approving a consideration of award of contract to Norm Maxfield, Inc. for strategic planning services for future revenue options not to exceed $338,050. Okay, so we're pulling item 11.7. Any other comments, questions, items pulled? Okay, I'll look to, s huh? I'll look to see if there are any um, members of the public that have Comments on consent agenda items 11.1 to 11.6. Anyone here in person? Anyone virtually? Okay. We have a motion by Director Rotkin. Second by Pegler. Second by Pegler. And we'll do a, do we do a roll call vote when we're in person? Okay. With the exception of number seven, I should point out. That's right, with the exception of seven, 11.7. We 
who he promoted to the prime minister. It's not. Aye. 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 I can't hear anything. I just hear people saying I. Can you hear us, Director Dutra? I can't I only I can hear you and I can hear people saying I, but I could not hear the roll, the roll. Oh, you, you couldn't hear Donna, huh? No. Sorry. I actually haven't been able to hear her really the whole meeting. So I don't know I if she's... have you noted for that, Jimmy. And I can hear... Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yes. Okay. okay. And I will um, confirm that we both can hear you. See, now I, you just went away again. So uh -huh. I don't know if you're backing away from the microphone, maybe. All right. How about now? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank so you. can I vote? Yes. Aye. We have you down as I. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. So that passes. We will now move to 11.7, and I'll pass it to Director Koenig. Sure. Thank you, Chair. I just thought this um, item bore a little bit more discussion. Um, I think it's one of the first opportunities we've had as a board to discuss the potential for a revenue measure in the coming years in a little bit more detail. Um, I was just curious about a couple things. I mean, first of all, have we done any um, initial polling about uh, a potential revenue measure. Second, um, you know, this is a fairly large sum of money. Uh, my, you know, back of the envelope calculation or, or from past experiences that a, a countywide campaign will cost about $400,000, give or take. So this is close to that amount. I'm curious, you know, if these services would actually be for the execution of a campaign or if they're simply um, research oriented. Um, I think it's also worth pointing out that 2024 is going to be quite uh, the year for revenue measures. Uh, I think many of the agencies that I'm a part of are discussing the potential for one right now. Um, so I was just also wondering how much we've talked with other agencies and um, I think several other directors here can talk about some of their experience on the, I mean, certainly the board is talking about potential, the board of supervisors is discussing potential revenue measures. Um, so yeah, I think that the timing bears discussion as well. I'll ask um, Michael if you want to respond to some of that. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? So great questions. Um, long story short, the uh, contract amount is task order based. So we would pay as we go and, uh, and look into opportunities. And one of them could be uh, a future uh, ballot measure. Certainly in November of 24 would be a, a potential time to go to the ballot. Uh, we have done polling, and uh, it's in the draft mode, and so we're, we're, we're looking it over, we're analyzing it, and our thoughts are to come back to the board once we've kind of locked in where we think that uh, poll directs us to as far as what the public sentiment might be for a potential metro uh, ballot measure. Um, but long story short, it's a multi-year contract, which should you progress uh, through various phases, so to speak, as you make decisions on whether you want to be on the November 24th ballot, um, this contract price would allow you to do multiple uh, polling events. And uh, generally speaking, to go out and do a statistically valid poll with the public is about a $50,000 endeavor. So this includes uh, those type of activities. Um, so. I guess the, the quick comment is uh, we're analyzing a poll that we've done. I would say early indications are in the draft poll that it looks uh, very interesting for the board as far as a, an opportunity to uh, potentially go that route. Thank you for the, the clarification. And, and I, I understand that this is um, sort of just an overarching contract and that they'll you know, pay as you go and certainly not a comment on the, the qualifications of Miller Maxfield, an excellent local firm, um, and clearly you know, scored very well in the RFP process. 
Um, I'm just wondering about the timing here. I mean, I'd feel a little bit more comfortable seeing the poll results first. I'm also understanding if that was um, looked at in the context of potential other revenue measures on the 2024 ballot um, or beyond. Uh, the other question I had is, are there potential revenue measures this board could look at other than a sales tax measure? You know, I, I think so. I think as we move forward, uh, part of the, the work of this contract and, and the firm of Miller Maxfield would be to look at all opportunities for strategic funding moving forward. And um, to that end, we've had some initial discussions with the city managers, uh, with the county administrator, just to kind of get a lay of the land and a feel for who's thinking what. So I think some major decisions are upcoming for the board, uh, and this contract allows you to basically gather the, uh, the information, put together this uh, final version of the, the poll so you have good information to, to act on. You're saying that uh, uh, Miller Maxwell would be involved in analyzing the poll results that we already have? Um, yeah, that's correct. I mean, I, uh, I authorize the poll under my spending authority um, and, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, need some professional assistance in making sure that I'm analyzing correctly the results uh, moving forward. Are there other directors or comments? Yeah. I, I have a question. Is that Jimmy? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, so when did, when was this poll taken? So it was the uh, first week of March, Director Dijon. It was, so it was recently taken in. Um, from your from your initial um, glance, and I know you're not a complete expert in this, um, you know, area of reading polls. Uh, what what do you what did you see in it? I would say, from a you know, like a real general comment perspective, that the public is. Um, appreciative of Metro, and even though the majority may not ride Metro, they see value in investing uh, the maintenance and future improvements of Metro. Yeah, I um, I actually had a conversation yesterday with um, a rider, or he used to ride Metro. He was really disappointed that the 91X was taken away, and that was his, he, um, it really shortened his his um, transportation um, through, you know, throughout the county. And so he's now switched back to driving in a car. But um, I think that we are going to have to do a lot of work on really trying to um, win the public's trust back, um, especially since, you know, when I, I believe when we, we did the Cabrillo College, um, you know, when they taxed themselves, um, that the 91X was really promised as a um, route that was going to be preserved. And um, that didn't happen. So I'd be really curious to see, you know, you know, what the, you know, public is, how, how they view us as a, as a, um, you know, as an organization um, when we, you know, already went out and promised a certain route and then we have recently taken it away. So that'll be, it'll be interesting to see the results of this. And I, I have to do, I mean, I, I'd like to, I kind of agree with um, Director Koenig as well as it'd be, it'd be nice to see these results first before really you know moving forward uh, with such a um with such a contract thank you Thanks. director dutra director rodkin um unfortunately in doing doing work on elections um it's not always for example trying to poll public opinion to get a realistic read of what the public might be willing to support and again in the end it's not the poll doesn't determine what happens the election does if you, when you have one but being able to run those polls on the basis of the uh, CEO, general manager's uh, ability to set them off rather than having a big public discussion about the poll gets you data that's useful. If you announce you're about to do a poll and whatever, in fact, groups get organized and, and uh, basically make the poll useless. And so I think that's why we're having the money available, the ability of our general manager to make a decision about when it might be the right time, what kinds of questions need to be on the poll. Um, Unfortunately, those are, I mean, we could, those are things that we have the input on, but I don't think it makes sense to have those discussions in public or to see the poll first or put it out in public before you then vote for the money that funds that possibility. I also have to say that there's not an agency in this county that doesn't 
really need to improve its public transportation situation, and we're the real key to that in all the five jurisdictions that we're talking about. So even though I know those agencies all have interests and they might be floating measures in a variety of different kinds, the idea that somehow we should step aside and wait for them to do their things, um, almost all of them have had bond measures on or local tax measures or different other things in the last several elections, and we haven't had an election for a general pay increase uh, other than the, the Measure D, which funded not just us, but all kinds of things, since 1978, when we I worked on that tax, um, to, to, uh, to get us our initial half-cent sales tax. And the result of having that kind of local self-help funding is what's responsible for all the federal, not all, but plays a key role in the funding that we've gotten from the federal and state governments, uh, because the ability to show that our local citizens support our public transit system is the real key to getting that funding. It moves us up in the competition for the variety of grants that we apply for. So I, I think it makes a lot of sense for us to approve this general amount of money as a, to be available for this process. And the board, of course, will get to weigh in on before we actually expend any of it um, you know, in the future. It's not like it's just a blank check to Michael Tree to go spend it on whatever he thinks we ought to be doing. The board will get a chance to actually weigh in. But it, it, it lines up uh, an agency that's demonstrated their ability to do this kind of work at a professional level and prepare us for this kind of uh, activity which I think is critical for this agency. A small additional infusion of funding to this agency would make a huge difference in facing all the problems that we're confronting now. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rodkin. Any other uh, directors, comments, questions? Uh, thank you for those comments, Director Rodkin. Uh, just one question is, could we extend the um, or, or modify the contract just to say that we could extend it through or an additional, either an additional period after the first extension of three years or make the second extension four years. I'm just thinking about maintaining the option of um, any efforts in 2028 through the end of 2028. I'm going to guess that, that, I mean, I'll leave it to staff to determine whether it's feasible, but at some point, the people bidding on this are tying up their resources and preparing for this. And if you ask them for another year, I bet they'll do it for free. I hope we can talk them down to the littlest amount of money <laughs> if we go that way, but I think that's recognizing them for free. It's not a free lunch, I guess. Michael, did you want to comment on that? I was just wondering if uh, Director Koenig could restate exactly what we were envisioning there. Just. So the, I think the contract says it's for um, two years with a three-year potential extension. Three years would take us to just pass the presidential primary in 2028. Um, I'm wondering if we either could add an additional option for extension or make the second extension period um, four years or maybe make it two two-year periods. Or, or sorry, three total two-year periods, just so that we have the option of extending the contract through the end of 2028, uh, which of course would be the next the 2028 presidential election. Thank you. If I could, the parties can always agree to extend the contract by amendment, and I think the question will come down to where uh, things are in terms of the uh, compensation by amendment. Sorry, can you hear me? Sorry about that. Um, the parties can always agree to extend the contract by amendment when the time is appropriate. I think the question will be where things are in terms of the compensation and if that item would need to come back to the board. But that's sort of that the option to amend the contract is always on the table. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, if there aren't any other comments or questions by directors, I'll move to, I'll see if there are any members of the public who have comments or on this item. Okay, anyone virtually? All right, I see Mr. Peoples hands up. Thank you, this is Brian Peoples from Trail Now. You know, in 2016, Measure D came out. Um, we actually came out as a political action committee opposed to Measure D at the time. And the reason was because they had 24% of the funding going towards a train, actually $14 million going to a new Monterey County train station. Um, so we were coming out to oppose it. And so what happened was Zach Fran and Don Lane, who was the mayor at the time, negotiated and changed the language. So they reduced it down to 8% 
of funding going towards the rail. And uh, the money was transferred to Metro, to paratransit. And, um, and so then what we did is we became a supporter of it. Um, and the, our supporters actually fund, provided the, the greatest amount of donations for Measure D, 2016 Measure D. And we all know how important that election was. Um, big supporter, we were a big supporter for Metro at the time. Having said that, um, watching how uh, the Metro board members on this board, when they're voting, how they vote on the RTC board, putting a train over Metro uh, funds, we questioned, we questioned whether we would support another sales tax measure for, for Metro. And I would actually tell you, if um, if we continue down the path of building a, an expensive, narrow um, trail next to the old railroad tracks where a train is not possible because it goes 20 feet from the ocean, um, that kind of leadership, we will I will become a PAC, a political action committee opposing any metro um, sales tax measure. And the reason is because we're watching how you're spending our money today and how you're misusing it. and you've only built 1.2 miles of the trail and the trail costs more than widening the highway so that kind of use of our tax dollars is not appropriate and so you going back and asking for more money we will oppose it if you keep heading down the path we're heading if you don't if you do fix, start moving in doing the interim trail and supporting that by all means uh, you know we'll support the metro tax measure but right now you guys are wasting our tax dollars and you're not building the trail in a timely and effective manner or environmentally, you're cutting 400 trees down. So anyways, thank you for your time. I just wanna make sure you know that if you keep managing the, our money the way you do, we will, I will become a PAC opposed to any tax measure for Metro. Thank you. Uh, I thought I saw Mr. Matt Farrell's hand up. Did you wanna? Make a comment, Mr. Farrell. You're unmuted. You can speak. Can you... Matt, can you hear us? No, he doesn't look like it. Matt, you can speak. Okay. You're well. Unmuted. His hand was up, yeah. So I think he can't hear us. I want to give him an opportunity to speak. He, and he's unmuted. Matt, can you hear us? You had your hand up. I can't. Okay. I think we move on. All right. Any other members wishing to speak on 11.7? Chair for Smart Local 23. Um, I just wanted to comment on a couple of the things that we've heard here today. Um, and I'd like to remind you that the RTC spending doesn't necessarily reflect Metro spending. And we started this meeting talking about the things that our drivers and our staffs do for this community. We need financial support to be able to do that. We have an extremely aged fleet. We have a shortage of staff across multiple departments. And the only way that we're gonna fix that is by remaining competitive. If we're gonna remain competitive, we need money. I think that Michael has shown over the last year that he's extremely responsible and extremely proactive in trying to fix these issues. And for him to come here and tell you, I need help doing that, it's very important. And I think we should look at that and see this man is doing everything that he can to fix the problems that we have. He needs your support to get it done. This is not money that is going to be wasted. This is nothing to do with the train. This is about Santa Cruz Metro and our bus system. And Michael has done nothing to make you question whether or not he would spend this money appropriately. We're in full support of you supporting us. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I'm gonna just see one more time if Matt's able to hear us and wants to speak. Matt, can you hear us? No. Doesn't appear so. All right, I'll come back to the directors for a motion for 11.7.
Director Rotkin. Uh, I'll move approval of the staff recommendation, but amend it to direct staff to meet with uh, Miller Maxfield to discuss the possibility of a, an extension option. Uh, I guess that's not part of the motion, but to frame the motion. If, for example, we might agree that if we have, if it's extended within a year or something, which doesn't require them to put aside a lot of resources to get ready to go. In other words, if you do it at the last minute, it's, a, it's expensive to add it, maybe not earlier. So the motion is to direct staff to talk with them about what it might cost us to have an uh, option for extension and to get them to come up with a proposal. Thank you, Director. Otherwise, approving the, the uh, matter before us. Second. I'll second that. Director Pegler. Further questions? Just one last question. Um, what is the um, spending uh, limit that you know, we have to come back to the board to approve any further spending under this contract? I think 50000 I'm prepared to support this understanding that we're not actually um, uh, agreeing to any specific expenditures today, but just the fact that we're pursuing this. Um, I also appreciate the time to sort of daylight this a little bit, discuss further among the board. Um, I do think there's some issues that we're going to have to address here going forward. Like I said, it's going to potentially extremely competitive environment in 2024. Not to say that this agency is not worthy, but um, you know, of course, it, it absolutely is, as we all expressed. Uh, I'm just want to make sure that we're all realistic about our about how best and most efficiently to invest our resources to be successful. Thank you. And I appreciate Director Koenig's comments because I do know, as he mentioned, other jurisdictions will be looking at funding as well. But I was good. I, I'm happy to hear that Michael and uh, staff that there's been communication with our local city managers and. CEO for the county, and that that's part of the research that you're doing is talking to the various jurisdictions, finding out what their plans are, and coordinating to where we'd all be most successful. So that that I agree is an important component of that as well. Uh, but otherwise, I support the uh, project. Great. If there is no further discussion, we'll take a roll call vote. Downey? Aye. Director Dutra? Aye. Director Collins Gray Johnson? Aye. Director Koenig? Aye. Director Lynn? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Newsom? Aye. Director Pegler? Aye. Director Quiros Carter? Aye. Director Rockin? Aye. Roll call. Thank you. Okay, moving to our regular agenda, we have uh, item 12, which is presentation of employee longevity awards. So I will present those now. Um, we have a certificate of appreciation for Javier Favela, and I will apologize in advance if I um, mispronounce anyone's names. Um, Javier Favela, who has worked with the Metro for 10 years. So thank you. Uh, certificate of Appreciation for Jose de Zamaripa um, in the Mechanic 2 position for 10 years. Uh, Patrick J. Forthen, bus operator for 15 years. And Maurizio Italia, bus operator for 15 years. And John C. Nevin, transit supervisor for 15 years. Thank you for your years of work with the Metro and we really appreciate it. Let me just make sure I didn't miss anybody. Okay. Um, I don't take comments on this, right? No, okay. All right, so moving on to agenda Maybe item. Maybe a round of applause for the certificate. Yes, thank you. Yes. That would be, <laughs> thank you. Is this thing on? Okay. There. I just wanted to make note that um, I know it's going to be a lot harder nowadays because we're short staffed, but back in the days we would invite these um, people that would get these longevity awards to our meetings so they could speak to you all. And I thought it was a great experience because you get to see these people in person and it was a big deal for a lot of people. So I'm hoping we could eventually get back to that. 
I'm not saying we could do it now, but um, it would be great to see it back. So thank you. Thank you for that comment. Okay, item 13 is retire retiree resolution of appreciation for Mark Saunders, bus operator. And I have a, a logistics question to Donna. Do I read the entire resolution? Can I? I don't need to. Yeah. I, there's some really nice things in here. I'll just take a moment to read it. Thank you. So, uh, whereas the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District was formed to provide public transportation. You know what? I'm going to skip over that stuff and talk about Mr. Mark Saunders. Um, Whereas Metro requiring an employee with the expertise, dedication, appointed Mark Saunders to serve in the position of bus operator, and whereas served as a member of the operations department of Metro for the time period of November 9th, 1999 to February 23rd, 2023. Whereas Mark Saunders provided Metro with dedicated service and commitment during the time of his employment, and whereas Mark Saunders served Metro with distinction, whereas the service provided to the residents of Santa Cruz County by Mark Saunders resulted in reliable quality public transportation being available in the most difficult times. And whereas during the time of Mr. Saunders service, Metro improved existing and built new operating facilities, converted the fleet to a CNG propulsion system, developed accessible bus stops, improved ridership, responded to adverse economic conditions, assumed direct operational responsibility for Highway 17 Express service and the Amtrak connector service, and assumed the direct operational responsibility for the Paracruz service, whereas the quality of life in Santa Cruz County was improved dramatically as a result of the exemplary services provided by Mark Saunders. Now, therefore, be it resolved that upon his retirement as bus operator, the Board of Directors of Metro does hereby commend his efforts in advancing public transit service in Santa Cruz County and expresses sincere appreciation on behalf of itself, the Metro staff, and all the residents of Santa Cruz County. Be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution will be entered into official records. So thank you so much, Mark Saunders, and let's do a round of applause. Oh, and we have a yeah. comment. Uh, I, I believe I need to make a motion. Do we need to take action on this? Yes, we do. So I, I move that we uh, approve this. Right. All right. I'll vote. Uh, Director Brown. Director Downing. Aye. Director Dutra. Aye. Director Colin Terry Johnson. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director McPherson. Director Newsom. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. Director Quiros Carter. Aye. And Director Rocco. And the motion passes. Now the applause, one more round of applause. Congratulations and thank you for all your service. All right, moving to item 14, and that is our state legislative update from Mr. Michael Pimentel. Mr. Chair, uh, uh, he is in uh, DC oh. up at the Capitol. So okay, should we move to the next? He might be able to switch and have uh, congressional federal lobbyists come in for a few minutes. Michael, we'll be right back. Sure. Let's do that. So we will be doing a, a item 15, which is our federal legislative update. Chris Giglio. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. I usually start my, my, you know, my, my riff is, you know, thank you for allowing me to come out here for the good weather. But right now it's, <laughs> it's super nice in D.C. right now. It's actually warmer, I think. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, it's good, it's good to be here in person for the first time in three years uh, and see all of you and uh, get together here. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, I thought I would kind of just go over a few uh, items that are going on here in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, one in particular that I want I kind of concentrate on with regard to the to the budget, but I have do have a couple of other items. Uh, the uh, the DOT budget, the IIJA Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or as the president calls it, the bipartisan infrastructure law, kind of implementation of that, and then. We, uh, we are in a new Congress. We started a new Congress, as everybody knows, uh, uh, in January. We started the first session of the two-year 118th Congress, so just a little bit about that. Oops. 
So uh, first, with regard to the budget, uh, the FY 2023 budget for the Department of Transportation and all other agencies as well was enacted in uh, late December uh, of 2022. That's about three months after the official start of the federal fiscal year. October 1 is the f uh, official start of the federal fiscal year. And it's been about 25 years. Uh, I think last year was the 25th anniversary of Congress last actually approving their budget before October 1st, so we've got uh, we've got some problems with regard to being able to enact a budget on time here in Washington, D.C. Um, for most of the programs at the U.S. Department of Transportation, funding was kind of uh, steady, a little bit of small, you know, sort of small increases. We really do benefit from that bipartisan infrastructure law, which also included, in addition to these competitive grant programs, a five-year reauthorization of federal transit programs. And so these, uh, these funding levels are kind of baked in, uh, hard, to, uh, hard to reduce. Uh, and so uh, I talk about small increases, but I don't want to um, I don't want to undermine the fact that the first year of the IIJA, which was uh, fiscal year 2022, included some pretty significant increases, particularly of uh, transit formula programs, 30% increase uh, sort of overall. And, and so they've really front loaded that, you know, those increases, kind of two or 3% increases after that. So, uh, so while I say small, these are still sort of much larger than, than FY22 with regard to that. So same thing with the, uh, with the bus programs, um, the competitive programs that we'd like to uh, apply for. Those also got some small increase actually over the authorized levels uh, that, that the infrastructure law um, has, has enacted uh, in this very goofy budget parlance. We call it a plus up. Uh, you've probably heard me say that before, where the authorized Congress takes that authorized level and increases it a little bit. Uh, and again, those are small increases on giant increases. So for instance, this low and no emissions bus program that is about a $1.2 billion program now. Again, back in FY 2021, that was about a $200 million program. So even though it looks like a small $150 million, I believe is what the plus up was for this program, it, you know, it brought it from 1.1 billion to 1.3 billion almost. So again, not, not insignificant with regard to that. Um, the FY 2024 process, budget process has started. Uh, you might have seen that the president uh, sent his proposed budget to Congress in the last few weeks. Um, just like every other president, uh, those are kind of considered by Congress to be dead on arrival. Uh, Congress takes its power of the purse really seriously. And so uh, they will take the president's uh, uh, budget under advisement, but they will also uh, make changes to that uh, with, regard to, uh, with regard to that. This is the one thing I wanted to kind of you know, talk a little bit more about, in, in, and that is these differences between the White House and congressional Republicans with regard to spending. So yeah, as we know, that um, um, Republicans are now in the majority in the House. It's a slim majority, but they are in the majority of the House. And so it's going to take some bipartisan negotiations to, to pass an FY 2024 budget. Up to now, uh, House Republicans have been uh, pretty certain in their desire to include a lot of deficit reduction in the annual budgets over the over the next few years. And while they haven't given us sort of specific programs that they would like to either cut or reduce or eliminate uh, to, to reach those very, very, I think it's $10 trillion over 10 years, some really uh, um, um, pretty, pretty big cuts. What they have said is that, oh, we're not gonna touch Social Security, we're not gonna touch Medicare, and we're probably not gonna touch defense spending, which is about half of the entire federal government uh, budget. So what we're looking at to get trillions of dollars of deficit reduction is a really narrow path. It's probably somewhere between 25 and 30% of the overall budget is where all of that has to come. And so that's where we talk about, where we worry about these Department of Transportation programs being vulnerable uh, to reductions, even with those baked in, um, you know, amounts uh, in the IIJA. 
that's, you know, it's kind of the president's law. And so I think that we may see some proposals by Republicans to cut back on everything. And, and, and I'm not talking on just about transit, but other things for you, those of you on uh, county boards and city councils, uh, you know, Department of Housing and Urban Development, really vulnerable, EPA, um, Department of Labor, things that, things that you care a lot about. And so it's going to be a battle. The president doesn't want to do all of this. As a matter of fact, his budget proposes an 8% increase in those areas that that we call the non-defense discretionary uh, budget. And so he's going to fight it. Um, but in order to get uh, a budget passed, uh, it's going to take some Republican votes. And so I think it's going to be a kind of a hairy summer and, and fall with regard to that. Again, I, I don't think, I think the 26th straight year, we won't meet that <laughs> October 1 budget. Um, and we may even have a government shutdown at some point in the fall. Uh, if I were a betting man, I, I would say we might have one, uh, of, you know, of, of a few days, a few weeks, depending on uh, when it happens. But, uh, but it's, going to be, it's going to be tough, uh, and we're going to have to do a lot of uh, work. Luckily, we've got a congressional delegation that's very supportive of, of federal transit programs and metro in general. And so, um, but we're going to have to work very hard to make sure that they know how important these programs are because... Again, if if there's you know there's horse trading that's going to go on, some somebody's somebody's gonna you know uh, what do they somebody's ox is going to get gored or uh, how they say it. So so anyway, so just kind of a you know just kind of a, a, a warning that we're 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 looking at kind of rough waters over the over the next few months, but hopefully we can uh, we can come out uh, we can come out okay. Let's see, I ruined this, Donna, with regard to the. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be going forward or it was before. There we go. Thank you. So I thought I might, with regard to that uh, bipartisan infrastructure law, IIJA, I thought I might kind of give you an overview of where we are kind of a year and a half in. It was enacted in October of 2021, uh, you know, about a trillion and a half in infrastructure spending. About half of that was that, um, was that transportation reauthorization. Uh, I feel like with regard to actual new spending, I, I talk about it somewhere in about the 500 um, Five hundred billion dollar area over five years, as opposed to the one point five trillion that people talk about overall. Uh, they were going to do that that um, the uh, transportation reauthorization anyway, and so I think so. The infrastructure bill kind of added on to that. So anyway, we're we've we've seen almost. I think uh, I think there's one small culvert program or something like that that needs to come out with regard to the competitive funding here. So, but almost all of it is sort of on the street with regard to notices. I think now, I, I, I say about half of uh, that first year uh, funding has been awarded. I think it's now a little bit uh, more than half of it, and others are, are getting ready to go. Here's just a couple of examples of those very competitive, but, you know, large um, you know, we're talking billions of dollars in competitive programs annually. So like the low and no emissions, which we care really, uh, we care a lot about. Uh, that mega grant program, which Metro benefited from with that, uh, the RTC Caltrans uh, Highway 1 uh, grant that was just given. Uh, and then this uh, Safe Streets for All, which is a, a, a pedestrian sort of uh, bicycle safety uh, program. And I believe the county got a, got a planning grant for that uh, recently. And so, um, so we, we do have... A, a pretty good idea uh, of how all of these look. You know, I was talking about uh, the the last point here, where I'm talking about um, what we what we've been seeing, and and it's what we've been expecting from the Biden administration. They're very focused on um, on particularly in the transportation area of making awards that you know that deal with safety, modernization, uh, climate change, uh, and equity. And the awards seem to. Uh, seem to bear that out. I would also say that the awards seem to be very geographically spread out, uh, and you know some some folks may think it's uh, it's not the case, but it seems to me that he's uh, that the the DOT has been making awards in red states and blue states, and you know uh, big states and small states, urban and rural. They've been really trying really hard to spread it out uh, in a in in an equitable fashion uh, with regard to that. I'll pop up to that second to last point with regard to the Biden administration. We are hearing and seeing uh, this administration really sharpening its rhetoric with uh, requirements uh, and Buy America is one of those, uh, which, um, you know, Buy America has been kind of the law of the land for a long time, but the federal government has been pretty 
generous with waivers. If you can kind of convince them that you can't find something domestically, they'll give you a, you know, pretty much give you a waiver for that. The impression is that this administration is really going to tighten up. They really want uh, everything to be kind of made in the USA. Uh, and in some cases, that could uh, that could make a, a project more expensive or uh, delay it, you know, with regard to supply chain issues and stuff like that. But like I said, the, this this administration seems very uh, focused on uh, on keeping those uh, rules um, in in place. And then the last thing I talk about, we 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 talked about this the last time I was I was on uh, line with you guys, but it hadn't been official yet, right? We've got we've now got a uh, a slim Republican majority in the House. Uh, I believe it's uh, Speaker McCarthy can afford to lose about four votes on any given uh, day if Democrats hang together. Um, and so that's going to make passing legislation there hard. Uh, the Senate, uh, same thing, very slim majority. I, uh, I count the one as uh, independent uh, Senator Kirsten Sinema from uh, Arizona, who was a Republican, changed parties, says she's not caucusing with either party. So that's why I'm, I've kind you know, there are, uh, among those 50 Democrats, there are a few independents. Bernie Sanders is an independent. There's a, a senator from Maine who's an independent, but they caucus with the Democrats. Sinema is not doing that. So that's why I see that. Um, and so as a result, you know, we're probably going to see a lot of Kamala Harris, the vice president, uh, in the Senate chamber to break ties. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, but, but again, that slim majority in the Senate gives us this kind of dichotomy between the two that where you know this, they're not doing the same things. The House is you know doing uh, doing their bills and you know and the Senate is doing theirs, and there's not a lot of coming together um, on on the same on the same items. Uh, again, we know this, but I you know again sort of official with regard to the House delegation. Uh, of course, uh, your know, Congressman Panetta represents a good chunk of Santa Cruz County uh, and has you know now uh, been given a lot of the area in the um, San Lorenzo Valley and all where where uh, Anna Eshoo was uh, representing. Uh, and then we've got a new member uh, down in the Watsonville area, Congresswoman. Uh, Zoe Lofgren, who's a really senior member of the House. She's a ranking Democrat on the House Science Committee. She's a very senior member of the House Judiciary Committee, very well thought of uh, among her colleagues. Uh, and I would imagine with all of this weather she and, and things happening uh, down in that new part of her district that she's getting to know it faster than she ever <laughs> thought she might, uh, which, um, but she's been very very interested and in, you know uh, the CEO has already got, you know even before the election briefed her staff on metro operations and so we've got a good relationship with her staff already and um, and she seems to want to uh, be willing to, to help and be uh, effective uh, in Watsonville and then the last thing I see you know I, like I was saying before the FY 2024 budget I think is you know that's the one thing that the House and Senate have to come together on right if this, the Senate can do their judicial nominations and they can do uh, legislation that the president supports but the House doesn't support, but eventually they got to come by together on this budget. They probably have to come together on this debt limit. You know, some people are saying uh, maybe we don't have to increase the debt limit, but the Treasury Department said sometime this summer it's get, we're we're gonna we're gonna run out of time, uh, and so that's another area where uh, I I will agree to vote for a debt limit increase if you agree to my demands with regard to deficit reduction. So again, that's that comes back here. House Republicans have a lot of leverage with regard to that. So again, have to be uh, very careful and, and, and fight for the programs we care a lot about. So that's about it in a nutshell, uh, but happy to answer any questions or if I missed anything, I'm, uh, um, I'm here, to, here to help. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Questions? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's clear that the, for structural reasons, the House Republicans and just the conservatives in general have, have nowhere else to go around the negotiating over debt and right. those kinds of things. Uh, because of structural reasons, the debt. But you have your ear to the ground in Washington. Are there people among those Republicans who are actually speaking about targeting transportation funding? Or is there a scuttlebutt and stuff? I mean, somebody going like, that's where I'm going to go get the money? Or is it just...
talk is about let's claw back unused um, pandemic relief money. If it's unused or unobligated, let's claw back out years of the infrastructure bill with no specifics, but it's sort of, I think Republicans you know, see those as maybe low hanging fruit because it's kind of out there but hasn't been spent yet. Let's let's take it and do that. So, but nothing specific yet, especially in the in the transportation uh, area. Sure. Um, trying to see if we are able to go out for public comment. Looks like we've got some something going on there. Let me see if there's any public comments uh, um, here. No? All right. Okay, good, great, yeah. All right, and I see Mr. Pimentel, so we'll go back up to item 14, and that is state legislative update. Hello, Michael, thanks for being here. There we go. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, board members. Appreciate your, your flexibility uh, this morning and allowing me to uh, move uh, after Chris. And uh, we'll, we'll say that I think there's going to be a lot of uh, congruency in terms of uh, updates and really some of the challenges that exist uh, here at the state level uh, relative to how, how you've seen challenges at the federal level. Uh, now, I would ask that we pull up my PowerPoint slides so I can run through uh, just a few items uh, that speak to where we are with this uh, legislative session for the 2023-2024 uh, year. So I'm going to pause for a beat so we can pull up those slides uh, and then uh, get underway. Uh, which slide would you like? They're, they're pulled up now. So uh, we can move to that first slide. Uh, and Donna, I'm not seeing anything on my end uh, with regards to legislation. Uh, so 2023-2024 legislative session. Okay, are you seeing it? I am not, Donna. Still now. Um, are you able to share it from your side? I certainly can do that. All right, so folks, I'm going to walk you through just a few uh, high-level updates with regards to work underway here in Sacramento. I want to note for you that we are uh, in the regular session for the 2023 to 2024 uh, uh, year. And here, uh, the legislature has reconvened uh, for this session. Uh, they reconvened on January 3rd, uh, and we are uh, just past a deadline uh, for submitting uh, legislation uh, for this uh, calendar year of 2023. Uh, that deadline was February 17th. Uh, and with that deadline, we saw more than 2,500 bills introduced in uh, this legislative session. Uh, for this calendar year. Uh, and I'm going to be touching on a few of those notable bills uh, that have some potential impact on Santa Cruz Metro as I move through my presentation. But just want to also note for you that as a matter of process, we're also uh, very quickly approaching a uh, spring recess. That's when the legislature uh, breaks for uh, a moment in time. Uh, and they will be reconvening on April 10th. And so between March 30th, April 10th, I expect no legislative action. Uh, but as we've seen over recent weeks, there has been a variety of legislative hearings uh, to consider uh, legislative proposals, uh, as well as uh, aspects of the governor's uh, proposed budget, uh, which I will touch on in a moment. Uh, so moving to the next slide, I'll just highlight for you one of those bills uh, that has some potential impact to Santa Cruz Metro. Uh, this is a bill that is being sponsored by the California Transit Association organization that uh, Santa Cruz Metro is a member of. 
Uh, this bill, AB 463, hearts. Michael, uh, if you could just is, pause one second. We lost the screen. One moment. Oh, we got it back. There we go. Okay, please continue. All right, sure thing. So this bill establishes for transit agencies this designation of an essential use customer. Uh, and that essential use customer status affords uh, transit agencies uh, with the ability to have continuous access to electricity uh, in the event of rolling blackouts. And the concept here is that uh, agencies across the state are moving very rapidly to introduce zero emission technologies. We've had a lot of discussions with the Metro team about uh, your own plans uh, for both battery electric hydrogen fuel cell technologies, uh, but recognizing uh, that there has been increasing demand on uh, California's electricity grid. Uh, the incidence of grid challenges has become more acute. Uh, that is something that may have an impact on your ability as an agency uh, to carry out uh, two core functions. One would be daily service delivery. Uh, the other would be emergency response. And I think as was alluded to uh, earlier in today's uh, board meeting, there have been extreme weather events across the state including in Santa Cruz Metro, or rather Santa Cruz County, that has required a Metro to be activated. Uh, this bill would afford a Santa Cruz Metro like agencies across the state with some added ability to have a reliable access to electricity. Now, I had prepared this deck uh, prior to uh, the bill being heard in the Assembly Utilities and Energy Committee. And today I'm pleased to note for you all uh, that this bill did pass out of that committee uh, with bipartisan support uh, and we'll be moving on to uh, the Assembly Appropriations Committee. Uh, now, I also want to highlight an additional bill for you, and this is one that we've talked about in years past, albeit in a different form. Uh, this is AB 610 by Assembly Member Holden uh, that would establish a, a structure for funding youth transit passes uh, through transit agencies in partnership with educational institutions. Uh, this bill was before the legislature last year, uh, as AB 1919, uh, and that bill did reach the governor's desk, but was ultimately vetoed uh, because there was not funding to bring that bill online. Uh, now this year, advocacy organizations from across the state are, are working to identify that budget resource uh, that can support this program, uh, and they're pursuing that in tandem with this uh, legislation, uh, which is currently a bill that's passed out of the Assembly Transportation Committee uh, and on to the Assembly Appropriations Committee. Now, I also want to highlight a bill that has the potential to uh, significantly modify the structure of transit operations, but also to laws and regulations impacting transit agencies uh, at the state level. This is a bill, AB 761, uh, by Assemblywoman Laura Friedman, happens to be the chair of the Assembly Transportation Committee. Uh, and here, this bill acknowledges that uh, even pre-pandemic, most transit agencies across the state were seeing declines in transit ridership, uh, but certainly because of the pandemic, we have seen uh, that ridership has become uh, increasingly stagnant uh, at a level that is well below pre-pandemic levels. And while that does not exist for every agency across the state, on balance, uh, it does. And with that, uh, Assemblywoman Friedman is looking to introduce a bill that would convene a new task force. Uh, at the state level uh, to review those challenges uh, that are presented to transit agencies in their recovery from the pandemic, and that also challenge agencies in their long-term uh, efforts to incite mode shift away from cars and to high capacity public transit. Uh, now this bill uh, is one uh, that just passed out of the Assembly Transportation Committee. Again, uh, this presentation was prepared before uh, this week's hearings. Uh, and the bill will be moving on to the Assembly Appropriations Committee. Uh, now, this bill is one that is very critical uh, in part because in Sacramento, there are ongoing conversations around transit operations funding uh, to address operational funding shortfalls uh, that are the outgrowth of the pandemic, but also to, to provide support to agencies in advancing strategies to regrow transit ridership. As the legislature has contemplated uh, those requests from the industry writ large, they've been very clear. Reform needs to be part of the conversation. Uh, this bill helps to advance one form of reform uh, to move uh, that type of investment forward uh, in this calendar year. Now, I do want to highlight uh, then uh, a few items related to the state budget. 
Uh, and here, I just want to note for you that Governor Newsom did release his uh, proposed budget for the fiscal year uh, 23-24 on January 10th of this year. And the budget picture is frankly uh, pretty dark. Uh, the governor's administration has projected a $22.5 billion funding shortfall uh, for this year. Uh, and with that, uh, as you'll see in a moment, there are a variety of proposed cuts that are on the table, primarily from discretionary spending as a mechanism for reducing uh, that budget deficit. And so here I want to note for you that perhaps the most operative uh, cut before the transit industry is a proposed cut of $2 billion to the state's transit and inner city rail capital program. Uh, now, as you heard earlier in the remarks, uh, there is strong interest from agencies across the state in building transformative capital projects. Uh, Santa Cruz Metro does, in fact, have a uh, request in uh, for uh, program funds from the TIRCP uh, for what is known as cycle six of that uh, grant program. Uh, and I will note for you that these $2 billion uh, in reductions speak to out-year investments. And so it would not have an impact on the funding cycle for which Santa Cruz Metro has just applied. It would speak to future funding cycles uh, that are actuated uh, through a new process. Uh, the TRCP by and large operates as a competitive grant program that is overseen by the California State Transportation Agency. Uh, these $2 billion in reductions relate to uh, a form of investment that would in fact flow through the regions uh, for a project selection at a regional level uh, for purposes that relate to uh, the interests of the TRCP program, which is largely building, again, transformative capital projects, but also supporting the transition to cleaner technologies uh, like uh, Santa Cruz Metro's interest in moving to hydrogen fuel cell buses. Now, I also want to note for you that another proposed reduction that is on the table is this $1.1 billion reduction in ZEV programs. Not that, not that full balance would impact uh, transit buses, uh, ferries, or locomotives that are deployed by transit agencies. Uh, it's a broad-based cut uh, that would impact light, medium, and heavy-duty vehicles, but there would be a proposed 10% reduction uh, to the investments that would flow uh, to the California Resources Board's hybrid and zero-emission truck and bus voucher incentive project, also known as HFIP that provides a uh, voucher incentive to reduce the incremental cost of transitioning to zero emission technologies. And I wanna just then show you what that looks like in, in real terms. I, I noted again, broad-based cuts across the board. You'll see that there are a variety of programs that have seen reductions. Those are spoken to on the far right column where you see the amount of funding that is retained relative to the initial budgeted amount. Uh, and then as I had noted, you see a roughly a 10% reduction uh, for transit bus across uh, programs overseen by CARB, as well as programs overseen by the California Energy Commission, which relate to infrastructure investments to support zero emission bus transition. Now, I also want to note for you one thing that does not speak specifically to elements of the transportation program that the state has control over. And so these are uh, programmatic investments that flow on a formula basis uh, and for which the state does not make annual appropriation decisions around. Uh, programs that are highlighted, uh, for example, include the state transit assistance program that is funded by the sales tax on diesel fuel. And the reductions that you're seeing here in terms of funding amount, and you'll, you'll see a, a total reduction of $118 million relate just to changes in economy, uh, changes in fuel consumption that have led to reduction in the revenue that is being generated by these funding streams. Uh, now, as I, I close, I do want to note for you uh, that there is uh, here uh, this um, focus on the next step of the budget process, and that is going to be the introduction of the May revise. Uh, this is an opportunity for Governor Newsom to present updated budget figures uh, that reflect the state of California's economy come mid-year. Now, here I want to flag for you that we are likely to see in this May revise a relatively lean budget, and that is because both the state and federal government have delayed uh, for some counties uh, across the United States, and in the case of California, uh, across California, 
uh, in, in filing uh, taxes. And that, that is because uh, of the extreme uh, weather events that we've experienced in recent months. And so as a result, uh, in normal years, we would receive the tax receipts in April. The governor would be able to present his best estimates come May. Uh, this year, that, that deadline has been postponed till October. And that means that, again, we'll see a lean budget come May. And then there would be some successive actions that take place later in the year uh, to plus up investments as we see a fuller picture for the state's budget. Uh, now, I also want to just highlight for you that the prospect for new uh, state transit funds uh, remains uncertain. I noted earlier in my remarks that there is a push for new transit operations uh, funding. Uh, that is going to be a challenge because of the state general fund picture, but also to the reality that other forms of discretionary investments like cap and trade are oversubscribed. And so the message we've been hearing from Sacramento in addition to reforms is the need for self-help for counties, for localities to bring online things like local option sales taxes as a way of, of supporting but tracing their individual programs and priorities in the absence of additional state support. And so I know that there was some conversation earlier in today's uh, board meeting around uh, Metro and potential efforts. Uh, here, I would say that there is uh, some congruency with some of the message that we're hearing here in Sacramento about the need for that focus on a self-help generated revenue uh, as opposed to leaning still on the state government for additional support. Uh, now, I want to note for you that uh, irrespective of uh, these, these delays in the deadlines for uh, tax receipts, uh, we are going to see a budget adopted uh, in June that will go into effect for the start of the fiscal year 23-24 by July 1. But then, as I noted, there would be later uh, term action, uh, likely in late summer, early fall, that would serve to provide supplemental investments uh, to support uh, the state budget and the priorities that the state has. And so at this time, I'm happy to take any questions, comments that you might have uh, on uh, the workings here in Sacramento. Uh, certainly a lot of activity. Unfortunately, with the budget outlook being as it is, uh, it's going to be a challenging year across a variety of fronts, whether budgetary or legislative. I'm uh, so happy to take questions. Thank you, Michael. Um, Director, uh, McPherson. Thank you. Um, number one, I've got a couple, have a couple of questions on Assembly Bill 610, uh, Holden. Uh, youth transit passes. Uh, what's the definition of youth? I mean, more than half of our ridership is UCSC and Cabrillo, well over half. Uh, does yeah. it just go to grade school or what does it go to? Yeah, so the way that they have uh, identified youth and the purposes of this bill uh, relates to the institutions uh, that uh, would be partner uh, agencies uh, with the transit agencies. And so here there's a clear identification uh, to uh, K through 12 institutions, uh, CSU, UC, and California Community Colleges. Okay. Um, and at the end, that you were talking about self help. Um, and part of the reason that all facets of transportation were included in Measure D, and that's why it passed, I think, uh, is that um, we, we became a self help county. Does this mean we have to renew our self help status? Uh, we are a self-help county. Uh, there's not not every county in the uh, of the 58 in California are self-help counties uh, with transit. Are we a self-help county now by definition of that, or do we have to do another thing to uh, quantify for being identified as self-help? Yeah. So I would say that you are, uh, as uh, Santa Cruz County, uh, currently a self-help county if you've operate operationalized a local option sales tax. Uh, or any other form of, of measure. Some counties have, for example, parcel taxes, uh, things of the sort, uh, then you are categorized as self-help. Uh, but the general point that, that I, was, um, I was making on that slide uh, was not so much a matter of new designation for counties or a new need to, say, get recertified as self-help, uh, but rather the general message that money from Sacramento may not be forthcoming. And if uh, localities have interest in making further investment in transportation or public transit, likely much of that revenue would have to be revenue that is derived uh, from the regions or from the localities. And so that has been the dominant message from Sacramento. There is some interest in having some honest conversation about additional state support, uh, but noting the budget picture and, and the challenges that, it, that we face here in Sacramento, again, that, that focus has been a message of subsidiarity 
and really that that focus on uh, generating revenue at the local level uh, to support local priorities. Okay, one uh, one final question. This could probably be addressed to both federal and state. Um, with uh, previously, we were talking about the, the federal legislation seems to be addressing uh, rural as well as urban. Uh, do you think uh, they're trying to uh, make that equal or as much? Uh, as fair as possible between the urban and the rural areas? Do you think that the, uh, we know where the power is in some of the big cities, for instance, in California and then the big states in, in the nation, but uh, is there any um, uh, establishment of fairness in all of these bills that uh, rural or uh, will get the same uh, attention as uh, urban counties? Uh, that's probably yeah. pretty hard to, uh, it's going to be a team effort, and boy, with the, the close situation we have in Washington, D.C., uh, that's going to be hard to, to, uh, to satisfy everybody, I would guess. But Yeah, what, what I would note for you is that you know, as we look at, at programs that would bring new funding online, uh, for example, AB 610, the Holden Bill on Fair Free Transit, monies would go out on a formula basis. Formula basis generally uh, defined uh, based on population. Uh, but then also, too, based on the revenues that are generated uh, by the agencies in the region. Uh, and so that prevents what is necessarily solely investment in urban counties and urban transit agencies and ensures that there is uh, funding that is spread across the state. On programs like the Transit and Intercity Rail Capital Program, one of the criteria for investments that they maintain uh, is a heavy focus on ensuring geographic balance, geographic equity in the total balance of investments that that program makes. And so I wanna, I, I suppose, you know, take this opportunity to note one thing with regards to uh, Metro's uh, TRCP grant application. Uh, we did work uh, very uh, closely with uh, CEO Michael Tree on uh, collecting a series of support letters uh, from your legislative delegation uh, to help support that application. Uh, and one of the things that we were very clear to elevate within that context uh, is the reality that irrespective of, you know, this focus on geographic balance, geographic equity within that, within that program and its long history, the reality is that Santa Cruz Metro has not yet won a, an award from that program. And so we're uh, very eager to highlight that within the state's uh, uh, review of that application, uh, recognizing uh, that uh, as that program moves forward, uh, there's going to need to be that that balance of ensuring that counties across the state are benefiting from its investments. Uh, and then, uh, Director, I also want to note for you that we're also seeing uh, some changes in leadership here in Sacramento, uh, whereby Assemblymember Robert Rivas, one of the members of Santa Cruz Metro's delegation, uh, will soon be elevated to the role of Speaker of the California State Assembly. And so with that, uh, I want to suggest that there will be a, a rebalancing of priorities uh, within uh, Sacramento policymaking and funding decisions uh, to further ensure that there's that balance between uh, rural and urban uh, counties across the state of California. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for our ser uh, your service for the transit district, along with Chris in Washington. I think we are ably represented by lobbyists who really do a great job of bringing us funding, and we should appreciate that. And the small amount of money we spend on that is well worth it. Um, my, my first question is uh, about the state budget situation. You'd said that there's about a $22 billion deficit, um, and then you outlined about $3 billion that's coming out of transit. Where's the rest of it coming from in, in the governor's budget? Yeah, the, the remainder of cuts are, are being made to a variety of, of things like um, energy programs, uh, some health and human services programs. There's a, a, a balance of investments that are being proposed to be rescinded, generally through, again, those discretionary investments the state has made uh, over these last few years. And, and my second question, and Bruce McChristian raised this, but the, the youth bill um, uh, 610 that's being considered, I don't know if you're the right person to answer this or our, our staff, but we have a program of free rides for youth that we're working on, and I'm just wondering what the relationship is between that federal, uh, state legislation and what we're already doing or planning to do. Yeah, so what I, what I would note for you is within the structure of the bill, there's actually an opportunity for Santa Cruz Metro to be able to draw down some additional state resources. 
so the bill is really focused on one, encouraging transit agencies that today do not have fare free uh, youth transit pass programs uh, to implement those programs. It does so by providing new resources to those agencies, again, in partnership with educational institutions. But the bill also does have a provision, or I should say a section, uh, that states very clearly, if you're an agency that today has a youth uh, transit pass program in place, and that can be, again, defined as a partnership with a UC, a CSU, uh, a, a California Community College, or a K-12 institution, uh, you can draw down on resources from that program as well to further support the efficacy of your existing programs. And so, for example, uh, no doubt you all are receiving uh, some form of financial support for your partnership with UC Santa Cruz with Cabrillo College. Uh, the bill would provide some additional resources in the event that you wanted to, for example, increase service levels uh, to uh, those uh, colleges, or in the event that you wanted to expand um, the, the nature of your service. Some agencies, for example, uh, may have their partnerships on for the duration of the school year. Uh, students, of course, oftentimes are around campus uh, for that full calendar year. There would be an ability to expand into additional months uh, for that partnership that may not otherwise be covered uh, by the agreement, the financial support that you receive uh, from uh, those educational institutions. And so built into it is, again, that type of support uh, for existing uh, agreements, uh, recognizing that we want to honor, uplift, continue to support those uh, agreements, and the reality that many agencies were out at front uh, making these types of partnerships uh, to the benefit of, of California students. Thanks. Thank you. Other directors have questions? Yes, sir. Oh, there we go. Got to push the button. Um, can you remind us, sorry if I missed it, the exact status of 610? Is it anywhere near the governor's desk? No, it's still several steps removed. And so uh, currently it sits in the Assembly Appropriations Committee. Uh, after it moves out of the Appropriations Committee, it will go to the Assembly floor. Uh, and then it will go through a similar cycle that it did in the Assembly, whereby it will be routed to the Senate Transportation Committee off, after moving off of the Assembly floor onto the Senate Appropriations Committee, onto the Senate floor, uh, and then onto the governor's uh, desk. And so still a few steps before that bill uh, is actually something that he may act on. Uh, and then as I noted uh, with last year, uh, we saw the same bill, largely same structure of, of this bill, uh, move to the governor's desk. Uh, again, he had vetoed that because there wasn't a budget appropriation attached to it. Uh, and so Mr. Holden is working alongside the sponsors of that legislation uh, to ensure that there is a budget appropriation uh, that moves alongside that legislative vehicle uh, to bolster its chances of being signed by Governor Newsom this year. My recollection from AB 1919 was there were difficulties when it reached the University of California uh, CSUs and so forth that it was called a youth pass. There are students of those institutions that are not youth. And so complications arose with what's the definition of who's in and who's out. Uh, if I'm a 50 or 60 something student getting my graduate degree, am I going to be included? So I just raise that as a concern that that be clarified in the new bill. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Pimentel, for the report. I mean, it, it is a challenging situation in Sacramento, clearly, that we're looking at. And obviously, if uh, these kinds of cuts do come to pass, it would be more difficult for us to uh, ultimately achieve our, our aspirational goals of 100% zero emissions fleet. Um, I mean, buses, as we all, <coughs> excuse me, all know, are not cheap. Um, so that was part of our message with the Central Coast Coalition is uh, to, to our legislators as they um, that they push back a little bit against some of the, the governor's proposed cuts uh, to TERSIP and um, other transit funding so that, um, because it does take this, it does take sustained funding in order to make a, a difference for our agency and for others throughout the state. Um, could, I was just wondering if you could remind me when we'll hear back about our TERSIP application. Uh, is that May, June timeframe? 
So, Director, I, I actually do not know the exact uh, time frame for that. Uh, staff at Metro may be able to better advise on that, but I believe it, it should be in, in the spring uh, time frame. Uh, maybe program awards some, sometime in April, I believe. Mid-April, that's what we're hearing. Yeah, fingers crossed, especially uh, given this could be a high watermark for current years. question um, regarding uh, AB 610. So as Director Rotkin mentioned, we do have a pilot program right now. How much impact would it have if we showcase some of our early successes in what we're doing? I, I understand it's a little different from what's being proposed, what we're doing locally, but um, is, it, is it worth our time to communicate our early successes with the state decision makers? I would say certainly to support the bill in, in moving uh, through the legislature, I think having communications with your legislative delegation about uh, the impact of the programs that you have in place currently in Santa Cruz County uh, would be uh, an asset uh, to their uh, deliberations on the bill. I will though note for you that as we saw with AB 1919, uh, the bill is likely to move forward without significant opposition. Uh, we have seen, you know, broad coalition, bipartisan support uh, on uh, both bills. And so I wouldn't, you know, discourage uh, the engagement. I would note for you that very likely it will move to the governor's desk uh, this year, much like AB 1919 did uh, last year. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, not, I'm not seeing any other. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, not to, sorry about that. Not to belabor the point, but. Um, as the bill, as 610 moves along, um, I don't know how much of an opportunity anybody from the CSUs or the UCs are going to have a, 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 some sort of um, either a consultant or, or some sort of um, mechanism to provide some feedback. Um, because as, you know, 1919, 2176 prior to that, as those were written, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's great in concept, but there are a myriad of gotchas uh, that could really backfire, at least how I see it. Um, I won't speak for any of the other UCs, but the way that a lot of transit is funded, the way that it's set up, um, I just, I notice there's a lot of gotchas and it's a great idea, but it really has to be well thought out so that it doesn't become, um, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't blow up in everybody's faces uh, and it doesn't re result in reduced services for students. Uh, which, um, if you look at it a certain way, it, that could happen. So, as this moves along, I, I mean, I don't know what opportunities we might have, I might have, uh, other experts when it comes to, um, you know, UC Transit for our students might have to chime in. But if that opportunity is there, I'd love to uh, be a part of the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And I do want to acknowledge that given where we are in the legislative year, uh, the process and, and the opportunities for, for engagement from stakeholders and the public uh, are immense. Uh, we do have a number of, of hearings that are going to be forthcoming, again, in the Appropriations Committee in, in both houses and the Senate Transportation Committee, and, and would certainly uh, advise that if this is a, a bill that uh, Santa Cruz Metro ultimately wants to take a position on or offer uh, guidance on, uh, we can certainly work with CEO Tree and his staff uh, to tee up what those recommendations are and advance them uh, to the relevant committees and to your legislative delegation for consideration. Thank you. I do see a hand up in um, the virtual public. Oh, I think you have a yes. Right? Is that is that correct? Get there. <laughs> um, so, Matt, please, Matt Farrell. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Kalantari Johnson and Metro board members. Uh, I'm speaking today in representing uh, Santa Cruz County Friends of the Rail and Trail. We wanted to let you know that we have written letters to all our state legislators, encouraging them to support additional funding for TERSIP and uh, for transitioning federal and state funding to allow uh, money to be used for operations. 
And finally, uh, encouraging them to support AB 610. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Assembly Member Gail Pellerin because she is a principal co-author on that bill. And we plan, on, we plan in the coming weeks to follow up with these legislatures and encourage their support for the bill. I think it's um, really uh, commendable that your team at Metro and the board have moved forward with this pilot transit pass pro youth transit pass program. And while I don't know the details, my intuition tells me it will position you well if the government, if the governor has the vision to sign this bill. So thank you very much for your time and for all your work. Thank you. Any other members of the public? Either virtually or here? Okay. Thank you so much for that update, Michael, um, and to our legislative update. Thank you. That's very helpful for us to get a sense of what's ahead and how we need to prepare and plan. So we'll Thank you for on. having me. Thank you. We'll move on to item 16, consideration of authorizing the CEO general manager to negotiate a lease agreement for 809 West Beach Street in Watsonville. Mr. Chuck Farmer. Hello. I'll wait till... Uh, Presentation comes up. Let's see if it works. Oops. Okay. So I, I wanted to kind of bring this to your attention, and I want to kind of go through this. And so this is uh, a property down in Watsonville, and what we're doing is looking to rent it as uh, I'll just say as a parking lot in a staging location. Okay. So I'm going to go through. Uh, the reason why we're looking at this lot is one, we are receiving hopefully by the end, before the end of June, five electric buses. On top of it, we've now, I think, locked it in that by May through July of this year, we're going to get 10 articulated buses from uh, Santa Cruz, or from, from uh, San Diego that is going to come up. On top of it, we are doing a lot of projects across the agency. This includes looking at a hydrogen fueling station that we're going to be putting in, which is going to go in our operations lot up here in Santa Cruz. We're also looking at development of Pacific Station, which is slated right now for November start date, uh, as well as the Watsonville Station, and then our SoCal Park and Ride, which is where our paratransit is going to be located. All of this, and I think going through the storms, I think a lot of the people in the operations side can tell you we've had to move buses out of our operations lot, stick them up on the street uh, to move things. We, we, we're just really kind of at our capacity at this point right now at our location. You know, getting these new buses in, it doesn't mean another bus walks off the lot. It also, we're getting in Arctics, which are 60 feet, and more than likely, the buses that go out are going to be 40 feet. So this is a bus and a half that's coming in, and we're only swapping it out with a bus that's 40 foot. So as part of it, we need some kind of location where we can put these extra vehicles until either they get pushed off into, um, you know, uh, whether it's auction or, for that matter, even storage. For example, we have a whole bunch of... Uh, equipment that's sitting on our uh, SoCal park and ride. And when they start, we're going to have to move that equipment somewhere. And there is no location that we have right now that we could put up uh, in Santa Cruz on our lots. Uh, we're, so we're kind of limited in that space. So this is a really about a space and resource issue at this point. Um, and like I said, this is a three-year lease that we're talking about, and we're talking about something that, you know, we could extend later on as well. And the lot is um, actually kind of large, and I'll kind of go through that here in a second. Um, and if anybody's talked to me, we've been looking at this for months and months and months, trying to find something. And up in uh, the city of Santa Cruz, there's no room. There's nothing in Capitola. There's nothing in Aptos. And literally, it pushes you down into Watsonville, which is the prime location, and it's actually a great location. We found a place that's actually a parking lot. 
the whole thing is a parking lot. We don't have to worry about a building in the way, and we can actually use this and utilize this space. So if we go on here, and like I said, I think I kind of mentioned a couple of these items. You know, this is overflow for some of our bus buses. <laughs> so, and like I said, we're going to use this for staging of all our stuff. Um, at some point, we're going to be getting hydrogen uh, fuel tank, and we're going to get hydrogen buses. I mean, we have this Tercel grant. If we get it, we're going to start moving on it. We may actually get the buses before the hydrogen tanks. Hope not. But if we do, we're not going to be able to use the buses, so we have a place to store it. And then once we start using the buses, you know, then we have double counts of buses. So as you can see, we don't have room. And, you know, this creates a, a real problem in the, fin in the sense that we're parking these on the street. And, of course, there's some neighbors there and so forth, as well as, you know, that we've had issues with some vandalism and so on, and, and we need them in our lots, not on the streets. So as part of that... Um, Excuse me, Chuck. Could you hold on a second? We're a minute and a half behind. Okay. We're trying to get these slides out to Zoom here. Oh, Okay. We're good now? Okay. All right, let's see if I can go on. Next one. So let me show you where it's at. Um, this map right here, which hopefully everybody who has a screen in front of them can actually see it a little bit better. In the top right-hand side, that is our actually current Metro uh, Watsonville Transit Center. Um, if you pull out, go over to Beach Road and hang a right, driving down Beach Road, it's all the way down on the left-hand side of the road. The, the actual distance on it is just a little, I think it's a little bit over a mile. And this is the property itself. So right now it's 809 West B Street. It's 3.36 uh, acres. It's almost fully paved, whether it's tar or whether it's concrete, but it's, it's mixed match throughout there. Um, and as part of that, it, it, the, the size of this is more than enough than what we need for right now, but the, the, the value that we did by going around and looking at other locations, we were either constrained where it was either a huge building that took up the majority of the lot, which of course we don't need a place with a building, or it ended up being a grass field where we would have to do a whole slew of inf infrastructure improvements to lay down pavement and so forth. So this actually fits our needs because this is exactly what we're looking for. Um, and then this is what it looks like right now. As you can see, it's got a fence already around, and then you can see the pavement, and it goes all the way back, not quite to those buildings back there, but uh, close to it. And right now, Green Waste is actually renting a, a portion of it, and they're on a month-to-month. -month. So if we go get approval to move forward, Green Waste would have to shift their vehicles back over to their lots, and then we would take the lot itself. And then as part of it, uh, just to kind of give you an idea on the size, if you take the parking lot that's sitting in our maintenance facility, which is on the left, and the parking lot that's in our operations facility on the right, and you look at the acreage, it's roughly about the same size of all of that. So we're really doubling our parking area at this point. And... So to get the cost, so what we're asking is it's approximately $11,000 a month uh, on the lease piece. Uh, there's a permit cost of roughly about $10,000, and we're estimating it's going to be less than $90,000, but just, 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 just to clean up the lot, maybe fix if there's a hole in a fence or something like that, and so forth, if we have to put up some lighting um, as a parking lot. But that was pretty much the whole full investment is about $100,000 a one-time sunk cost, and the rest of it is leasing, and that's $121,000 a year. 
pros on this, like I said, it's ideal location. The availability, that's been really tough. I mean, like I said, we've been looking for a year and can't find anything. This came up. The cost is very cheap. This is the cheapest place. Uh, there's a place right down the road on beach that's really just, um, uh, I guess it's a grassy area, much, much smaller, but they want to sell it for $3.8 million, far beyond what this is. So <laughs> we're, you know, right there, we've got a good deal. Um, like I said, increased parking and storage serves as a backup location. You know, if something happens here, for example, like right now, if we had, if we knew we were going to have floods again and we have to move those buses up, we could move those bus, half those buses down there and store them until the floods are over and then bring them back instead of sticking them on the streets. Um, and then at the same point, and I'm just going to mention this one time, uh, at some point, uh, our Watsonville facility is going to be up and be under construction. And then we also have the Watts, or I'm sorry, the um, the uh, SoCal Park and Ride will be under construction for parat paratransit. And where our paratransit is located right now, the lease will be coming due here in the next couple of years. And we will have to move, and we could use this as a bridge to uh, move paratransit and then, of course, move them into their new place when they're here. So um, that's another uh, good thing. You know, the bad thing, like I said, it's, it's incremental spending for the location. And then, of course, it's the sunk cost that I just talked about is the fact that it costs a little bit more money. Anybody have any questions? Can you tell us how this fits into our budget situation? Is this going to require an amendment to our budget, or it's already been out of a fund that's already anticipating this, or how, how it's going to get funded? So how it's going to fund is through our operating capital reserves, and it is actually in the budget, the budget I presented, and then what you saw that's in on, on consent right now. We actually put it in. The capital costs are much higher, so they'll come down based off of what we have here. Farmer for a great report. Um, I mean, it's a fantastic lot. Like I said, close to the highway, close to our existing transit center in Watsonville, so it clearly meets a lot of our needs. I was just curious about um, the existing SoCal Park and Ride lot that we're renting in Capitol. I think it's SoCal Research Park, right? Um, how big is that lot? What is our current lease, and does it expire? For the SoCal Park and Ride? Yeah. So we have it. We own it. Um, yeah. Well, to clarify, yeah. we we own the location off of Highway 1. Yeah. We're storing bus shelters there. We actually move paracruise operations to it? or Oh, uh, uh, the sorry. research. I meant, I meant the paracruise operations that I think. The current today. Yeah. Current. yeah, so current today, it's in Aptos. It's in an uh, industrial area just north of 41st. And we're back in a corner. We've given up half the space, so now we have only half the space left. Um, the way it, uh, it works is very tight back there. It, uh, when an operator comes in, they have to pull the bus out and pull their car in because there's a lack of uh, parking right now. The lease, the way it's set up right now, it actually expires here in August. And we have an option for, two options actually, for one-year extensions that we can use at any point in time. And at this point, I know that the landlord does want us out sooner than later. There is no doubt about that. I understand correctly that we could potentially move paracruise operations to this Watsonville lot, or is it just the future storage of the bus shelters? Those three options. I mean, I realize we're putting a lot of demands now. Yeah, so if, 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 if we have to move or we make a decision to do it, I'll work with Julie and team on, their, on the general counsel, but we could move temporarily uh, the paratransit, the, everything, uh, the operations center and so forth, Bring them down to Watsonville. They can operate out of there until the pair, until the SoCal Park and Ride is complete, and then at that point move them in. Great, thank you. Um, can I speak? Oh, yeah. Is that Director Duca? Please. Yes. Can you hear? Okay? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, so I, I guess historically going back, I think that you know it was a big mistake for us to sell our property when we owned it here in Watsonville. I think it was on Cicada Lane. Um, but it's nice to see that you know there is a, um, or hopefully there will be um, support from this board, you know, to move um, some of the facilities down to South County. Uh, I guess my question is, I have a couple questions. One is, 
what's the term of this lease? Um, and because we're in the middle about, of about doing our general plan um, here in Watsonville. And so um, I think that the zoning in that area may be up for um, um, discussion on the future of that area. So just wanting to make sure that if it does get zoned in a certain way, the owners aren't like gonna pull um, you know, all the work and money we've invested into that area, um, you know, in order for, to benefit financially for that for themselves. So um, can you answer that question first? Yeah, so we're going in with, uh, basically it's, a, it's um, our offer is $11,000 a month for three years. And that's going to our real estate agent who's going to pass it over. The owner of this property knows that if this goes through, that's approximately what we're going to do. Do they come back with a five-year lease? I, I don't know yet. I, th this is our initial uh, pushover to them to find out. I think that a five-year lease is safer just because of the uncertainty of you know the market and probably in any city today. Um, I mean, to make an investment that we're going to be putting into this area and then in three years to you know, have the lease, um, you know, ended. I mean, this happened with, you know, uh, with um, cannabis growers, right, going in and and a lot of some of our businesses in that area got pushed out because um, they wanted to ha go in a different direction where they could get more money for their for their um, location. So um, it's I, I don't know, I just feel safer that if it was a longer lease, um, just because three years we blink and three years is over. I mean, it's time flies so fast. Okay. I mean, we, we could look at five years or, or however, I mean, I'll talk with Michael about it and we'll decide which way we want to go. Yeah. I think, you know, I, I think we'd be interested in talking, but I think big picture wise, we're finding that Watsonville would be an advantageous location for a permanent facility for Metro. So your uh, zero emission bus master plan, for example, has all of your electric buses being charged and operating out of Watsonville. Uh, by far the majority of your employees are from Watsonville that operate the buses. So this is a strategic location to make it easier for people to be employed with Metro. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Um, so our thought is uh, this is a property in an ideal situation. So let's go lease it and then use it as a staging area because we have a need that you need. I think over the next year, we're really going to take a look what other properties are around and then make a very aggressive approach uh, with board direction to acquire property that uh, we could use as a local match in a federal grant, which, which requires some analysis. And, uh, and then at the end of the day, purchase a property. So I, would, uh, I just want to counterbalance, uh, Director Dutcher, the thought that uh, a long-term lease may not be as advantageous as we hope because our thought is we'd like to purchase property. And this may be an ideal location to purchase it, but it, we haven't done the analysis. Uh, it's pretty rigorous, uh, but this property is ideally situated for a short-term need. Yeah, okay, and I and I appreciate that. And I, I also wanna say thank you for, um, you know, being considerate of, you know, the workforce that does live down here in Watsonville. And um, I do appreciate the fact that, you know, we're, we're trying to, you know, be a little bit more inclusive. Um, I do, and I, and I do see the vision that you have, and this may not be the exact location you're looking for. So on that temporary term, you know, I definitely, um, you know, I could be, I'm supportive of, of course. And, you know, I would like to see a get, you know, the permanent um, happen down here. I, 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 I feel too often, and I know that this is a, my voice is a lot of sometimes some of the board members don't want to hear, but I feel that, you know, Watsonville gets a lot of taken away from them a lot. And, uh, um, uh, and one being the property that we had down here that was sold that probably never should have been sold. So, um, you know, moving forward, I do hope that when we do try to find that permanent spot, that that South County Watsonville it comes back and um, you know we meet the needs of our drivers because uh, like Michael said a lot of them do live down here and um, you know we uh, and and we build a facility that I think that will be you know really 
um, you know, moving forward thinking. And um, and I know that this the demographics of this community will really put us in a position for for grants. Um, I you know when we when we speak about going out for funding, I know that um, the demographics of Watsonville really puts us up in a um, in a different tier. And uh, when it comes to getting these grants, and I hope that when we do move forward, that the permanent facility is um, located down here. So um, with that said, I will support the, um, you know, the temporary, you know, lease for this property, but I'm hoping that this board and um, it sounds like, you know, Michael are, is already have, has the vision of having something permanent down here, that this board does move um, with making sure that a facility does find itself down here in Watsonville. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Okay, I'll look to see if there's any public comment on this item. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up another point of us needing a backup facility uh, for our operational standpoint. Our current metro base, we only have one way in and one way out. When we were threatened during the fires and we needed to evacuate those facilities, we utilized the downtown metro station to store all of our vehicles and run operations out of it. That will not be an option for us come fall and into the winter. So if we are found in that type of situation again where it's not accessible or something happens to that portion of Highway 9, we will need somewhere to be able to go. Otherwise, we simply will not be able to run and get any of our equipment out. So we also support this temporary lot as pretty much necessity for us to be able to guarantee that operations will run on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any hands virtually raised. So I'm gonna ask the board. Well, I'm, I'm ready to make a motion to approve the lease proposal. I'll second. I first, second or next one. Uh, Director Brown. Director Downey. Director Dutra. Aye. Director Colin Terry Johnson. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director McPherson. Director Newsom. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. Director Quiros Carter. Aye. Director Rock. Aye. And the motion passed. Great. Thank you so much, Chuck. All right. Next, we are on item 17, Reimagine Metro Oral Update, and we have um, Planning and Development Director John Ergo. Good morning, Directors. Uh, John Ergo, Planning and Development Director. <clears throat> it's nice to be with you all in physical space, uh, the first time in three years in my tenure as your Planning Director. Um, <laughs> So, in a minute, I'm going to introduce Daniel Constantino from Jarrett Walker and Associates, uh, who's going to give a briefing on where we are to date in our reimagined metro process. This is again, this again is a 15-month uh, planning process that we kicked off in January uh, to evaluate comprehensively all of metro's routes and services. Not something that we've done here since 2016, um, and uh, to to develop. Uh, service scenarios for our, our current resources uh, and future opportunities to expand the network should additional resources become available. So the team uh, from Jarrett Walker has been here uh, in Santa Cruz this week, uh, meeting with our bus operators, riding our routes, uh, conducting in-person meetings. We had a Zoom meeting uh, on Tuesday. Uh, it was unfortunately interrupted, but we had over 40 participants uh, that stayed with us throughout the meeting uh, to share uh, their feedback on where they would like to see a metro go in the future. Um, and what we're hearing is people want more. Uh, they want more service, they want more frequency. We heard that in the fall uh, when we did some survey work preparing for this process. We heard that over 70% of uh, respondents at that time wanted to see more, more frequent service. Uh, we also heard that over 50% of non-riders would ride metro more if the bus came more often, which was a phenomenal uh, response to get from a survey. And we're hearing the same thing from our current riders. So this initial round of outreach is all about engaging with our, our current riders uh, and stakeholders in the community. Um, and we're hearing a lot of the same things. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Daniel up here from Jarrett Walker and Associates to share our initial uh, 
results from the first round of outreach. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Costantino. I'm a principal with Jarrett Walker & Associates. Uh, we're a public transit-focused consulting firm. All we do is help plan public transit networks throughout the US and abroad. Um, I am the project manager on the consultant side of the team uh, for the Reimagine Metro project. Um, and I'm going to give you a little update of kind of what we've done so far, a little bit of what we found out, and then I'm happy to take any questions or give any further context that y'all might be interested in. So let's see if I can click this. Do I have to be pointing in a particular direction? Yep. Afraid I'm not, uh, does not seem to do anything. Oh, there we go. All right. Thank you. Um, so first of all, uh, for anyone not familiar, uh, what is Reimagine Metro? So this is a project to re-envision the network. And when we say the network, what that really means is it's a fancy word for where buses should go and how often they should run in those places. And so uh, as part of the key goals of this effort, we're really looking at creating a network that is more relevant to the community's needs, that is more useful, that is more attractive for many people's trips so that you can really shift the conversation from a place where transit is a relatively marginal part of the transportation system in the county to something that is useful and attractive in many people's daily lives. And so that involves a few components. Um, one of the more obvious ones is kind of to adapt to all the various changes that have happened in the last three, four years between natural disasters and COVID and everything else. Um, another part, quite frankly, is to increase the amount of service provided. And so a lot of the work that we've been scoped for is to see what we would do um, and how we would, um, what we would do with increased resources, how we could improve service, how that would improve people's lives. So as far as the process goes, it's kind of in three phases. There's a first item that we're calling early wins, which is really about looking at what can we do with the resources that are going to be available in the next year. And so the, by resources there, I kind of mean money, but I also mean how many actual drivers you're going to have, what actual buses you're going to have, all of the stuff that you've spent a fair amount of time talking about today. So we're going to look at how we can improve things in the next year. Uh, taking into account some of the realities that are coming down the pipe, such as the changes at Pacific Station, for example. Um, next phase after that is looking at alternatives. And what we mean by that is we're going to look at what are the different ways that you could change this network if you were to uh, put more service in. And so depending on what your policy priorities are, you may make different choices. Uh, about how to increase service. You may make choices that are more oriented toward frequency in core, in core corridors. You may make choices that are more oriented towards getting um, service closer to more houses. There's different ways to look about it. Those are probably the two biggest ends um, of the spectrum there, but we haven't yet defined exactly what the alternatives are, but we will be working on them. And then we will go out to the community with these alternatives, get their input on that in the next phase of outreach. And based on that input and based on um, direction that we will be soliciting from yourselves as the board on that input, we will be then developing a plan. What's the plan for change for the future? Um, and we'll present that plan again to the public and to yourselves. And based on that, we'll go from a draft plan to a final plan. So quick reminder about who's working on this. We're working, um, obviously this is being led by the planning team um, and John Ergo at Reimagine Metro. On the consultant side, you have a team led by uh, the firm that I work for, Jarrett Walker & Associates. We're working in association with a local firm from Monterey called Ama Transit Planning. And really we specialize exclusively in public transit. We reimagine public transit networks in a lot of different communities. Um, and we do it in a particular way where we're really interested in responding to community input, making policy trade-offs clear, balancing a lot of different and potentially conflicting goals. And we always want to be really clear about what those different goals are and the ways in which they work together or they conflict. Um, so 
this is uh, not the first place we have worked as a firm or where I've personally worked, uh, even locally. Um, I personally was the project manager working with the AMA team on the COA for Monterey Salinas Transit, and the, which resulted in the recently uh, implemented Better Bus Network um, in Monterey County, California. Um, we've also worked throughout the US and abroad, um, put in a couple examples here that are relevant locally and more largely. Um, Jarrett led the um, next network, uh, bus network redesign for Santa Clara VTA a few years ago. Um, in recent experience, I've led the Monterey Salinas project. I also led a similar project in Madison, Wisconsin, which is obviously a big college town, somewhat like yourselves. Uh, possibly the most interesting project that I've had the pleasure and the honor to work on in my time as a consultant has been uh, managing the uh, bus network redesign study for Dublin, Ireland called Bus Connects, which also involved a very significant increase in service. They were really looking for a step change in, make, in making the bus a more relevant options for all sorts of trips. Um, and of course our partners, AMA, have worked with us on many different projects um, throughout California and also somewhat beyond as well. And okay, so as to what we've been doing, um, we've been working on this project since January. And in that time, we've really been in a process of learning. We are obviously not from here. We don't know your communities yet. We are in the process of learning. And to do that, we're going through it in several different ways concurrently. Um, John mentioned some of the meetings that we've had with the public. Um, I would say that I'm grateful to Metro, first of all, for having done a general public poll before this study even started, which gives us some understanding of what the public wants, uh, both riders and non-riders. And then in this first phase, when we've been engaging with the public through um, a series of surveys uh, with riders, and those surveys helped us recruit rider-focused groups that have happened both virtually and in person. And we've had meetings with a whole broad variety of stakeholders representing all sorts of different community organizations as well as the city and county governments and the University of California at Santa Cruz. Um, so that's one part of it. Another part it has been uh, the desktop exercise of reviewing all the relevant census uh, and local um, RTC data on, that may be relevant to transit needs and transit demand. And we've also been um, reviewing all the data that Metro has been able to provide to us on your existing and recent service, uh, frequency, schedules, ridership, all sorts of things, as well as having conversations with uh, Metro operations, both at the supervision level and yesterday my colleague um, Alvaro was at the uh, operations uh, dispatch talking to drivers. So we've been learning about things. So I just want to give you a quick overview of some the types of facts that we're interested in as we look at this kind of study. So we're really interested in where people are and where they need to go. And so the map that I'm showing you right now is a map of population density kind of throughout your current service area. And so basically, if areas are marked in blue, they're areas where relatively many people live compared to the size of the area. They're, they're relatively densely populated areas. And what's clear from, you know, you, and you already know this, right, but is that People are very concentrated within the kind of urban and suburban areas in this kind of 30 mile long corridor from Watsonville up to Scotts Valley. Um, and that that's about 80% of your population. And so that's really the areas that transit is able to be f to serve in an effective way in for fixed routes. And that's kind of what we're focusing on most. Um, the other thing that's clear is of course is it's not just where people live but where they need to go that you don't have a single dominant center of travel where people need to go. There is not one big you know, downtown CBD or, or um, that really dominates everything. You have very, some very large destinations, UCSC probably the largest one for transit right now, but you have others that also generate really significant number of trips, like downtown Santa Cruz, like around 41st Avenue and Saquel, like in actually several different parts of Watsonville, downtown being just kind of the biggest one, um, or even kind of out here in Scotts Valley, there's relatively significant concentration of jobs. And even saying those, I'm missing a whole lot of other places. So the reason these things matter is because when we look at how to distribute transit service and how much of it to put, the 
key thing that really determines whether a transit service is going to be useful to many people is whether it's near many people and near the places they need to go. So we're always looking at density. Where is there higher density? The more people and destinations are near transit, the more people are likely to find it useful. The other thing is that your destinations being uh, kind of distributed through a wide area and with significant gaps between those areas, uh, well, that means that transit is relatively more complicated and expensive to provide because there are a lot of long distance trips and there are a lot of relatively empty sections in terms of bringing more riders on board. Another thing that um, I want to point out, um, I think that there is a clear sense in all the conversations we've had about the importance of travel out of county, particularly up to San Jose. And I want to say to you, yes, that is true. There is a lot of travel over the hill. But even dis and despite all of that, uh, the majority of commute trips, as is being shown on this map, but probably all trips as well, uh, and perhaps even more so, is really staying within the county. And so there's a real value at looking at how you're going to serve trips within the county and how you're going to improve that, because that will have ultimately the greatest impact. Although we will, of course, continue to look at regional links. Other thing that's really important is where different people live. And by different, I mean the characteristics that are relevant to transit. I'm starting this with a characteristic that's not directly relevant to transit, which is this map of race and ethnicity in your county. So the, this map um, shows little dots. Each of those dots represent about 25 people, and the color of those dots represents the race or ethnicity that they have reported to the census. And you can see on this map really clearly how there are some very stark differences between South County, Watsonville, and surrounding areas, and uh, greater Santa Cruz. And I would say that those differences continue and accentuate as you go north towards um, Scotts Valley and the San Lorenzo Valley. Um, now, those differences, the fact that you know Watsonville has 80% of its population speaks a language other than English at home, probably mostly Spanish, those aren't direct things that impact whether people need transit or use it. But they do reflect a whole lot of other factors that are relevant. So some of the factors that are relevant are where there are people who don't own cars. And we see that there are a few really clear concentrations um, in your core service area, which I'll now focus on more specifically for the rest of these maps. Um, so you can see that there's a high density of households without cars in Santa Cruz itself, particularly on the west side, somewhat on the east side as well. Um, there, and there are several large concentrations of households without cars in Watsonville, both downtown Watsonville and a little bit of north Watsonville kind of going toward freedom. And there's also uh, a fair number of people without houses um, in the Live Oak, but specifically perhaps most towards Pleasure Point and a little bit towards the Dominican Hospital. And so there's also all sorts of reasons why people don't own cars. Um, for some people, it's simply because they live in an area where it's relatively convenient to walk, and so you maybe need it less. I think your housing costs have a certain impact on people's uh, pocketbooks and what they're able to do. Um, but there's a, one of the factor that you know comes that correlates a lot with it is income. And so you, here is a map. That's the map of where people don't own cars, and this is the map of uh, density of people with low incomes. And so again, the darker colors are showing you the higher densities. And if I flip back. Back and forth, maybe I can. Doesn't seem like I can. In any case, if you if you were able to see, there's a lot of the areas that showed up dark in the last map show up dark in this map too. Uh, but there are also other areas with large low-income populations that didn't show up, that don't show up on the no-car household map, and that's areas where you have a lot of low-income people who, for whatever reasons, the places they live in and the uh, options for walking, cycling, and taking transit don't match. And so they essentially, despite their limited resources, are being forced to own and maintain vehicles in some cases. I'm sure many people enjoy owning and maintaining a vehicle, but it is an economic burden on a lot of households. Of course, when we look at a map of low income in a community like yours, we know that that means many different things and many different types of transit needs. So for example, on the west side, uh, a large part of the high density of low-income people has to do with students, whereas in Watsonville, we're looking at a lot of um, large, relatively low-income households. Um, and in the middle, in kind of Capitola and uh, Pleasure Point, we're looking 
for the most part, at larger concentrations of low-income seniors on fixed incomes. Those are not absolutes, but those are kind of the big patterns that we see in the data. So here, for example, is a map of uh, density of people under 18. So this is really telling you where there are families with children or families with a lot of children. You can see that the points that stand out the most are in Watsonville. There are some areas that stand out in the greater Santa Cruz area. Um, but that kind of tells us something about the types of the different types of poverty that are in different communities, um, right? So there you can see that, again, how that goes. Um, and then if you look at the map of seniors, you can see that there are parts of Watsonville that show up too. So again, large multi-generational households, but as well, the um, kind of pleasure point area really pops out on that map. And you can see that there's a lot of low-income people, so kind of getting back at what I was saying before. So anyway, these are just various factors that we're looking at when we try to understand both demand and need. But it's not just about who lives in places and uh, who lives in places, it's also about how the, the built environment facilitates the use of transit. And so that's something that we've also been examining. There's two factors that really matter a lot here. One of them is walkability, and that is partly about how easy it is to, well, it's about two things, really. But the basic point here is that if it's difficult, if you're in an area where it's difficult to walk to places, uh, almost certainly this is an area where it's challenging to provide transit that's useful to a lot of people. And that's because if you put a transit stop in a place where it's difficult to walk, fewer people can get to it. And fewer people are willing to make uh, the trade-offs to their safety that may be involved in some cases. Or if you have a street network that simply doesn't allow you to walk very far because there aren't a lot of streets and they don't connect a lot, then you just can't get to the bus stop very easily. It's things that look very nearby on a map turn out to actually be rather far away by the paths where you can um, actually walk. So we've mapped this out um, in Santa Cruz County. And you can see a really clear difference between areas in the city of Santa Cruz, for example, which show up as having very high street connectivity and so being relatively walkable, versus, for example, areas in the Live Oak where if you're right near one of the main streets, perhaps there's a fair amount of places you can go to. But we know that the street networks are very disconnected, lots of cul-de-sacs, um, not a lot of paths from one main street to another. Um, and so as a result, there's going to be this issue where any transit service going through the Live Oak is simply going to be slightly less accessible to the people near it. And that's something that we have to keep in mind. In Watsonville, you can see kind of the same thing. The older parts of Watsonville developed at a time when it was standard to build uh, walkable cities very walkable, very easy to get from one place to another on foot. And then some of the newer places in Watsonville that also, however, have high densities of population and population with significant transit needs, not so connective, a lot more challenging from a pedestrian perspective. Other thing that really matters, and this is in terms of um, designing the service, is whether it's possible to connect a lot of places in a straight line. Everyone wants to travel in straight lines. Buses uh, are no exception, and people on buses are no exception. That people want to take the fastest path from A to B. Um, but a bus also has to take that path and has to get close enough that people can actually uh, use it. And so when you have a lot of places that, are, that aren't located on straight paths between the beginning and the end of the line, then it's hard to run bus lines that are both efficient and useful. And so that means that we're going to end up in situations with, and you already do have these, locations where there are tough choices. So one of those, for example, is right here in Scotts Valley, where, you know, there's a bus line. There's probably going to continue to be this bus line in any imaginable scenario that goes from Santa Cruz to San Jose. And it's useful to a lot of people. Along the way, you have Scotts Valley, and you have a ton of jobs in Scotts Valley, particularly along Scotts Valley Drive. And so there's a natural question about, well, should the bus that goes from Santa Cruz to um, uh, San Jose uh, stay on the highway, because that's the fastest way to go there for people going from Santa Cruz to San Jose? Or should it get off the highway for a few minutes and serve Scotts Valley Drive, and a whole bunch of other people might find it useful? Conversely, if you do that, you make it less useful for people going to San Jose. So there's value in choosing either of those two things. Uh, and there are a lot of parallel situations throughout your county. But the reality is that a single bus can't do both of those things. So we're going to have to be looking at those choices. In terms of your network as it stands right now, I want to kind of give you credit where it's due and maybe talk a little bit about some of the shortcomings of the system as well. Um, 
first thing here, this is a map of the transit network as it exists right now. The lines uh, within the core area, we also have a regional map that I'll get to. The lines on this map are colored, and the color of those maps mean how often the bus comes. And you'll see that uh, there's a few lines in this dark blue color that means it's coming every 30 minutes. And there's a bunch of lines in this light blue color that really means the bus is only coming once an hour on this route. And even a few lines that I can't even see from where I'm standing right now, but they're in a light gold color, and they just come a few times a day. And that being hard to see is deliberate on this map. We want to point out that there's service there, but it's so thin that you may not even know it exists or have a way to use it. So a lot of routes are infrequent, and why does this matter? Um, well, actually, eh, I'll skip this part. Um, it matters because frequency uh, means less waiting. And really, waiting is the biggest thing, is one of the biggest things that prevents people from using transit. People don't have time to wait. They need to get places. And so when you make a more frequent service, you have to wait less. You also have easier connections. So if you happen to need two buses, you wait less twice. So there's that much more impact of the added frequency. It also means there's less impact on disru from disruptions. So if, for example, for some reason a bus doesn't show up because perhaps you have a vehicle shortage um, or a driver shortage, if a bus is supposed to come every 15 minutes and you miss one trip, well, maybe you'll wait 30. If a bus comes every 60 minutes and you miss one trip, they'll have to wait two hours. So as a result of all this, higher frequent service is more convenient and gets a whole lot more ridership, even more ridership per unit of service. And I just want to leave you with this little tidbit about frequency. If you're not a person who uses transit a lot or you know people who don't and you're talking to them about it, you can just think of that frequency as being how often you can leave your house. So really, you can imagine that there's a gate at the end of your driveway. You don't have any control over that gate. And it only opens every once in a while. If it only opens once an hour, well, it's better than not opening it at all. But how useful is that, really, for getting to where you need to go? To give you credit where it is due, um, you have regional service right now in a way that has disappeared in many parts of the US. It is, in fact, possible to travel from San Jose to Santa Cruz to Watsonville to Salinas, albeit with MST, but in a way that connects with your service. Um, and that's really great. Um, and you have actually kind of a really nice basic system in that way. Um, so you have those regional services. Um, and I just want to say that one of the other, the other thing about that is that some of those regional services are doing double duty. Heard um, Director Dutra earlier talk about the 91X. Um, that was the express service between Watsonville and Santa Cruz. Right now, you still have a bunch of service between Watsonville and Santa Cruz, but there are all lines that combine local and regional service. 71 spends a bunch of time on Freedom and Sakel Drive. The 69 spends some time on Sakel Drive um, coming into town into Santa Cruz. There are good reasons for it to do that, um, but it does mean that there are certain uh, reliability issues that end up impacting the regional routes. Quick note on things that are happening in specific areas. In Watsonville, uh, there may be a perception that there isn't that much service. There's actually kind of a fair number of bus routes in Watsonville. And they, there are a lot of streets where, with multiple bus routes, but none of these buses are coming more than once an hour. They're all going different places. It's all really complicated to figure out. And so when we hear some of the feedback that we've heard, for example, that some service changes that happened in Watsonville were particularly confusing. There's all sorts of reasons why people may or may not be confused about service changes, but one of the things that's true is that if you're a transit rider in Watsonville, you're holding a lot of information in your head because of how many routes there are and how they all go different places. And so um, that is going to necessarily make using the service more difficult, even if by doing all those complex patterns, you're maybe you can point to a lot of very specific needs that you're pointing out. Another thing to note is that despite all these bus lines, there are certain parts of Watsonville that don't have service. And probably the biggest one I'd note is kind of where you're planning on putting that uh, temporary facility along Beach Street. There are a ton of jobs on Beach Street. And there's no service there, uh, Beach Street south and west of Watsonville downtown. So those are some of the issues we've noticed here. In Greater Santa Cruz and Capitola, probably the biggest issue that we've noted so far is that Despite what it may look like when you look at a pretty map like this, you have two essentially entirely separate networks between the west side and the east side of the San Lorenzo River. Everything in the west goes to UCSC. And a lot of service in the east is really 
geared at those regional connections. And as I said earlier, doing double duty with regional. Um, so the reason why that matters is that you obviously have significant uh, housing affordability problems on the west side. Um, and you have a lot of people trying to travel between east and west side as a result of those. And they all have to change buses if they're doing that at Metro Center. And there are issues with changing buses. When buses are at very low frequencies, as I've said, it's very complicated. It, it, by complicated, I mean you lose a lot of time if you try to change a bus. And so that constrains how many people find the service useful. At UCSC, we obviously have another very complex situation. This is obviously really critical to the success of what you're doing right now. It's about half your ridership. And there have been a lot of overcrowding and reliability issues at UCSC. And I want to stress that those issues are not related to directly to the quantity of bus service being provided on campus. There are a lot of buses on campus. Perhaps not enough of those are metro buses. There are about eight metro buses an hour. But when you add all the campus shuttles that are also running on campus, uh, you get to about 20 buses an hour. And when you see that red line there, those are some of the um, the TAP shuttles that run on campus. So we have a situation where what we've heard from people um, who ride on campus is that the metro buses are overcrowded, and but the campus shuttles have spare capacity. Um, we've also heard about slow service, a lot of issues with, you know, there's obviously very constrained narrow roadways, so buses can't pass each other. There's really a situation where you can't just, you don't, students or people in that area have not, are, are not getting on the first bus that comes by them for a number of reasons. And I think that um, there's a good argument for looking at how do you make every bus useful enough that people get on the first bus that comes by. There's also certain operational issues like um, the fact that people are, are checking fares that really slows buses down. In any case, there's a lot to be looked at up there. In terms of where your ridership is concentrated, um, I think I heard Dr. McPherson talk earlier about how more than half your ridership was at UCSC and Cabrillo. That is true, with UCSC being probably the largest by far there. In terms of where there are a lot of trips that are attracted, the west side, but also uh, Capitol Le Mall shows up a fair bit. And I don't think it's just because of transfers, because of how infrequent the service is, but there's a huge amount of employment and retail in that area. Cabrillo shows up, and a few little points in Watsonville, and also in Scotts Valley, Caviar Transit Center. I think there's, um, I think what we're seeing there, and I'm still figuring it out, is basically a whole lot of park and ride and kiss and ride activity uh, for people coming in from the San Lorenzo Valley. So as we've been talking to the public, just a few of the broader concerns we've heard and that we know we need to address, reliability, uh, especially in Santa Cruz, and by reliability, I mean the ability for buses to uh, to be on time and to run when they can run. Um, we've heard a lot about communications. Um, and it's sometimes hard to tell if what we hear is a result of what's happening right now or of what's happened historically. But we've heard a lot about people need uh, more ways to get the, the message from Metro about when things are changing and how they're changing. This is true uh, throughout the county, but it's particularly true in South County. And it's particularly true with everything that relates to messages uh, in Spanish. We've also um, been made conscious of some of the issues around your fleet, um, around its age, the condition of vehicles, um, and kind of, I, I think it's excellent that you're looking at getting more buses right now, and I think that's going to be necessary as you go forward. More broadly, there is a sense that in the last 10 or 20 years, service has really degraded, that there used to be really good transit. We've even heard of people who moved to Santa Cruz to be carless and who are no longer feel that they're able to do that because transit no longer is doing that. And some of that has to do with factors that are beyond the control, your control from the pandemic, right? Uh, and it's downstream consequences, like all the shortages that we're experiencing now. And some of that are um, perhaps decisions that were made along the way. There is, in fact, significantly less service now than there was 15 years ago. Um, and that was true even pre-pandemic. Um, and it's possible to get better service, but ultimately what drives service being very useful and a lot of people finding it useful is having enough of it that when people need it, it's there. We also heard about transfers. There's a huge reluctance among your current riders to envision transfers, and we think that's very much related to the service pattern as it is right now. Infrequent, untimed transfers are simply unattractive. I think there's some transferring that's going to be inevitable in any version of this system, and so we need to find ways to address that. 
um, perhaps be it through um, making transfers less expensive or free, be it through timing transfers, be it through more frequent service. So in terms of the project, right now um, we've been learning. Uh, upcoming in April uh, with staff, we have kind of a network design workshop where we're going to be looking at kind of what early wins are, what alternatives are going to look like. In July and August, we're going to go out to the public with the alternatives to hear more. And we're going to summarize all that we hear back from the public so that we can get direction from the board to develop a draft plan uh, to be ready in November. And then um, over December, January, we'll do outreach on the draft plan. And all, our goal in the end is to have a final plan in March of 2024. So with that, uh, that's all I've got. Thank you very much. And if you've got any questions, I'll be delighted to entertain them. Thank you so much for the presentation and the work. Um, questions from directors. Director Lackman. My first question is, could you give us a better idea of what it is that uh, AMA or AMMA is doing for you? In other words, what's the division of labor between Jerry Walker and Associates in that group? Uh, in this project, that division of labor is around outreach. So AMA are, they specialize in two things. They specialize in paratransit and they specialize in outreach. And so they are our outreach subconsultant. They're the ones who are organizing the surveys, the public meetings, the stakeholder meetings, all of that. Um, yeah. My, my second question, um, we are in the process of implementing a GPS system that will allow us to know where our ride, current riders get on and off and um, destination origin, destination all that stuff that we don't have data on right now. We don't have reliable data on right now. Do you see that data, which that data is going to be coming to us in this, literally this planning process. Do you see that affecting, you know, how, the, in other words, to what extent are we doing work now that's going to get, have to be redone or something given that that data is going to be coming out a little later than the start of the process? So, uh, Director Rockin, we have had a GPS-based system. Uh, we're, currently, we're just, what's happening is we're transferring that system to a new vendor. So we've already been collecting that data for the last two years. Oh, okay. It's part of this analysis. We also did a, a ridership uh, automatic passenger counter uh, sample. So we actually have stop level ridership as well. So we're using both of those data sources currently. So the implementation is really, it's short of the next bus stuff, but it's not short of the next bus. Yeah, the, what's happening now is more on the public side, you know, real time information, the data we've already been collecting and using in our analysis. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chair, thank you for the great presentation. Um, you know, you mentioned with the Watsonville routes how much data someone has to have in their head to effectively navigate the system because of all the different routes. And I think that's fairly true uh, countywide. And one thing that left an impression on me was uh, visiting Boulder a number of years back, and I was just sort of a, a poster child for uh, improving bus service. And um, you know, we hear all the time about how they renamed their system. I think it's the Hop. Not exactly hop, skip, jump, but it's something it is. Those, it, it is. Is it fact. hop, skip, jump? Okay. Um, and how that was part of their, their strategy just to make the, the whole route, um, the whole network easier to understand as a new rider or, or an existing rider for that matter. Um, how much are we looking at, I, I don't know, either renaming the routes or rebranding the routes or is it just simplification? How, how, do, how does that approach play into this? So um, that sort of depends on the time horizon you're looking at. For the early wins, um, not that any of these decisions have been made yet, but my sense is for the early wins, we're really looking at what changes can we make that will improve things and minimize confusion in the short term. So we're probably not going to radically rename routes. I mean, unless for some reason there's a reason to make it clear that a route is different from what was there before. When we're looking at alternatives for the future, though, um, we're certainly not going to start from, we're, not, we're probably not going to start from the basis of the route names that are there now. And so something that happens in these processes is while we're doing that planning work and that consulting work, we just come up with entirely new names. And usually they're like one, two, three, or A, B, C, um, because we don't want confusion with what's there now, and we wanted to make it as easy to understand as possible. Um, and especially if the shape of the network changes a whole lot as a result of that plan. So maybe one of the alternatives is less different and we retain a few of the existing root names and one is very different and they're all, they're all new names. 
It's a little hard to tell right now. In terms of the route names as they come out at the end of the process, I think there is, there's a part of that that comes down to your own marketing and communications and how you think that's gonna go down best, but certainly what we typically advise is if you can make the more important routes have the lower numbers or have letters, that helps. People, people know route one is important, people, that, that's easy to remember. Um, I don't know. I, if hop, skip, and jump is what works in this community, that's great. I'm not sure. Personally, I have mixed feelings about that one specifically, but yeah. And what about the, and this is probably more for John, the app that we've been working on for writers. I'm wondering, it seems that would be a way to help the confusion if they can go to an app, not only know the on time, but maybe be able to negotiate the right, the, the different routes or the different. Yeah, uh, thank you, Director Lynn. So on March 16th, for the first time in Metro history, you can actually open up Google Maps or Transit app and see real-time information. We only have about a third of our fleet that's equipped, um, but that'll just continue to grow as we roll out that program. So customers can currently see on a portion of our buses uh, where, where it is uh, in space and time, whether it's delayed or on time. And uh, again, that'll, I think by April, we're targeting full full deployment of that system. So it's really exciting. And we'll, and that will also let someone look at the right connecting route if they're, such as a confusion in Washington, they may, may simplify that, I'm mm -hmm. thinking. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm trying to understand the timeline for all of this, you know, short term and long term, and I'm thinking about development, for example, um, at the Capitola Mall. Um, I don't, I don't know how you're working with the different um, cities and the county government to to find out what's coming down the pipe, like the really grand potential. That <clears throat> is any of this, that information going to be incorporated in in your system? I'll let Daniel add more if he needs to, but the sh the cost neutral short term again is this year. We're looking with current resources. The future growth scenarios we will be taking into consideration uh, future planned land use changes. Although it is mostly based on current use, because we're we're looking about you know two to four years out for f the first blueprint phase, the first growth scenario potentially, and then maybe five to ten for the second. But the second one would definitely look at future land use. Is there anything? Can I add a, point, a couple points to that? Um, so uh, um, just to add, uh, we have been in communication with the cities and with their planning departments. We've had um, initial uh, meetings with um, all four, I believe, cities um, and the count, um, and county planning staff, um, as well as UCSC, to understand kind of what the big projects are coming down the line. Um, and um, in addition to that, we're also engaging them directly in that alternatives development process and in the planning development process. So at the moment when we are trying to figure out if the bus should turn left or right here, there will be, if the cities are willing to provide that, a staff person from the city to participate in those conversations. Um, and so that's, that is happening actively. The other thing that I want to point out, though, is that for those longer range needs, and yeah, we are mostly looking at the next two to four years, but the, f the fact is that you're in an extremely constrained situation in terms of land in this community because all of your valleys are like this wide. And so ultimately, I think that there was going to be continued value in strengthening uh, the, uh, the land use pattern you have now, and by that I mean we, in designing the transit network, I think there's a back and forth between that transit network and where land use should probably intensify in future if you're anticipating future growth. And so we're gonna be looking at that in tandem with the cities as we go along. Director Chris Carter. Thank you, Chair. Um, Daniel, I just wanna say thank you for highlighting some of the issues in Watsonville. Um, particularly the walkability and the infrequency of the routes. Um, I also just wanted to add, there's a, a lack of bus shelters in Watsonville. That's a big issue because people also don't want to be sitting out in 
the sun for an hour, so I just wanted to highlight that. Um, and I do have a couple questions. So my first question is about the frequency from Watsonville to Monterey County. I, I know you skipped over the slide um, just in the interest of time, but I was just kind of interested in where that ranked among the popularity of the routes. Um, and then the second question, I, I was hard to see back here, but I had um, I wanted to see the circulator bus. I don't know if that was up there, uh, but that has been a huge improvement in Watsonville and just getting around. Um, I noticed that downtown was a frequent area, but that's because that's where the, the bus stop is, <laughs> the bus station. Um, but the I was just curious about the patterns with the circulator uh, because I think that was a much much needed uh, service in Watsonville. Um, thank you. Um, let's see, there's two questions. I'm going to, can you remind me your first question again? Absolutely. Uh, oh, Monterey, Monterey. You yeah. Salinas, yeah. Um, so there is currently hourly service between Watsonville and Salinas for most of the day, uh, seven days a week. That's provided on MST routes 28 and 29. Each of those routes operates every two hours, but they alternate, and one of them goes through Castroville, and the other one goes through Perndale. Um, that is, um, it is the same amount of service that was there before December, but it's been coordinated now, so that it is happening once an hour. Historically, that service has been provided by MST. I think um, I'm sure they'd be delighted if they, if Metro wanted to contribute to strengthen that, but that's a decision that's certainly beyond uh, my ability to make. Um, and there, and there, isn't, there are, in fact, a certain number of, there's a certain amount of travel between Watsonville and Salinas um, that certainly could get better served. But it is nice that you have that line, and it is at Watsonville Transit Center. Um, as regards shelters and bus stop conditions, I think I have to defer to John. Uh, I'll, I'll plug a second parallel study we're doing right now, uh, which is a, it's, it's called the Silk Hill Rapids Project, but it's looking at line 71, 69, and 91X, as it formerly was, and we plan to bring it back. And it's, it's looking at bus stop conditions as, as part of it. And they've analyzed the shelter loca the locations, conditions. On those corridors, we found that only 39% of stops do have shelters. And so what that study is doing is teeing up our ability to go out for future investments uh, in bus stop improvements in that area. So it, it's definitely top of mind. Um, we haven't seen the sun in a while, but rain for sure. Shelters were on, were on top of customers' minds as as Emma and Jade and Jarrett Walker have been doing outreach. It's It's been coming up in every discussion. So, yeah. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Um, I know Director Dutra um, participating online had some comments and questions. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, Chair, Chair, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I wanted to say, first of all, thanks, Daniel and Director Ergo, for your presentation. Um, it was it was extremely honest, and I um, really I appreciate that honesty. And um, what it does say is that we do have a lot of work to do um, in order to increase our ridership again, which is definitely has fallen um, over the years. Um, just to kind of repeat a couple of the things. Oh, I also want to say thank you for um re reiterating that the 91x will come back this plays into kind of the conversations that i hear in south county is the um the convenience right i mean the 91x offered convenience from watsonville to santa cruz and um and um also with all the transferring as well um i know that uh that has also become an issue um and that was brought up this this today as well um i know i worked with you guys um in when we had the we we did the elimination of um, uh, a route in Watsonville, and we um, brought Lincoln Street back into the phase through conversation. So um, I know people are really, um, you know, this de this deters people from riding the bus when they have to have all these transfers. So um, I, I I guess my question is, with ridership decreasing it's has not I, I don't think since i've been on the board since 2014 have i seen ridership increase um i've seen it decrease i've seen routes decrease um and uh and i've seen um transfers become more um uh, happening more often than um direct um, routes from one shot to another how are we going to um fix this with, I guess, the budget that we have, um, you know, the already the loss of um, community buy-in, um, you know, when people have to get 
from Watsonville to go to Santa Cruz to work. And, um, you know, we just took away their 91X, which gets them there on time. And now they're having to go back into a car. What do you, um, how do you think we're going to be able to turn this around? I, I'm, I'm trying to like see the, the light at the end of the tunnel here. Thanks, Director Dutra. So the fundamental point of this exercise is uh, to answer that question of how we can make Metro more useful for more people. We think a lot of that comes through frequency and some of the things that, that Daniel has talked about. It's also gonna come through future investment. I mean, that there's a direct connection between the amount of service that we can provide on the street, which is completely related to how, many, how much operational resources we have to provide that service and how much ridership there is. And we saw a decline in 2016 with the last uh, comprehensive operations analysis that we did because that led to a reduction in service of 10% and pretty much an equal reduction in ridership coming out of that. Um, it was successful in the sense that it, we didn't lose more ridership than that. Um, uh, but, you know, the first, the cost neutral, we'll, we'll just be frank, it's going to be really hard uh, to grow, grow ridership uh, with our existing resources. Um, but that being said, we think, we think there is a way with, you know, all the, the, the maps and the way that, uh, Daniel portrayed in the slides their services, you know, it's confusing for a lot of people. And we think they're this early win scenario, which is, you know, we hope to be there by uh, May, late summer, and, and implementation in, in winter uh, will, will uh, improve things for a lot of people. And frankly, during the first round of outreach, we've been hearing a lot of positive things, uh, you know, about Metro. Not, not that people are giving up, but that people want more. Um, so Dan, if you wanna add anything to that. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'll add a couple things. First of all, because I anticipate you'll hold me accountable for what I've said in the past and the future, I want to clarify that I did not explicitly say 91X was coming back. Uh, I think we Director recognize Ergo, Director the... Director Ergo did. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, great. Great. Uh, then I'll... I'll, I'll uh... <laughs> I will all right. hold you accountable. <laughs> Um, not that, although I totally recognize, we've heard about the 91X plenty, and so that's not to say that I don't recognize that need and the value of that service. Um, in terms of growing ridership with your existing budget, I think I'm just going to be more brutal than John and tell you that they are not going to grow ridership a whole lot with your current budget. That's not, um, you've cut service over the years, you've lost ridership as a result, um, and that's, those things are correlated. And when we look at the research and we look at the data from many cities and many places, the single biggest determinant of whether there is high ridership for transit in a community is if there is a high amount of service relative to the population. And so while increasing service on its own is not a sufficient condition to increase ridership, the service has to be useful, as long as you remain at your quite handicapped current level of service. We can make it more efficient, we can help a little bit at the margins if we do things that are smart and that reflect the community's needs, but you're not gonna see a step change in transit's place in the community with the existing level of resources that are allocated to the service. So I just wanna say that, you know, I understand that, you know, UCSC has a huge ridership and they're a big portion of this ridership. Um, the problem that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of noticing down here is that the people, you know, our, our residents that work up in Santa Cruz, if you're now, you don't have that 91 X to get up there, it's adding, you know, an hour or so onto your trip to get to work. And so, um, because I don't, we may not have the numbers, it's still important to have that, um, you know, those, those routes available to the community, especially to, to South County. So, um, I don't know if we're going to be basing our our decisions on these future routes off of, you know, the the um, you know finances. Uh, how is that going? To, are we going to be able to add those routes back if if we're not the if you know the ridership down in South County is not producing um, the numbers or um, that like something like UCSC is produ producing? Can we still make sure that our people um, are having those routes? You know, because this seems kind of grim. <laughs> you know, overall? Uh, I'll, I'll say two things. One reason I'm a little rosier on my outlook on the current uh, level of service versus Daniel is that within our current budget, 
we know that we're still down about 20 operators. So we can add service. We're still trying to get back to pre-COVID, but we can maybe even increase beyond pre-COVID, assuming we can hire uh, and train operators in a timely fashion. So that's, that's one reason I'm rosy. Uh, in, in terms of responding to your question, uh, Director Dutra, so we're gonna look at existing ridership. We're also gonna look at ridership potential. And a lot of the analysis that Jarrett Walker and Associates has done so far uh, within Santa Cruz County and within Watsonville in particular is looking at that ridership potential. He, he showed a lot of information on you know, where density is, uh, no car households, youth, and so there are things that we're doing today that aren't serving those areas as well as we could, um, and that's within current resources. Uh, in terms of the 91X, I did say it was temporarily suspended. I'm not sure it's gonna come back exactly as the 91X, maybe it'll be called the Route 1, who knows? Uh, but we do understand that there is a, an important need for a faster connection between Watsonville and Santa Cruz that takes advantage of uh, the auxiliary lane project on Highway 1. Um, MST took surf line from us. I think that's copyright infringement, but we'll call it something that makes sense to people in Santa Cruz. And as soon as we have the operator resources, we'll bring it back. The, the changes that we put in place uh, currently with the 69A, W, uh, and 71, uh, it's only, not, I'll, I don't wanna say only, it's 20 to 25 minutes longer commute. It's not an hour. Um, and we've actually increased the frequency between Watsonville and Cabrillo College all day to every 30 minutes, every 15 minutes between the four routes, between the three routes. So it's not quite as bad as we're making it seem, but we understand the need and the 91X is always top of mind for us, that connection between Watsonville and Santa Cruz. Thank you. Director McPherson had a question yeah. and then I'll go to you, Daniel. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Daniel and John for your candid presentations. Uh, a couple, I have a question and then I have uh, even an opinion at the end, but uh, in general when we're talking about reduced, you know, time factor stops, or it's 30 minutes minimum now, are we usually talking about 15 minutes as a good target or is that, is that a good one? Um, secondly, um, the, the, do you factor in the cost, fa do you have a cost factor if we want to go to, from 30 to 15, what that's going to cost, whatever the routes are? And secondly, or thirdly, and this is kind of an opinion of mine, um, we talked earlier about a ballot measure possibly in, in uh, November. My thought is, seeing that this is going to be coming to us a year from now in March, I don't know that it would be a good idea to put a ballot measure in, in November if we put something there and then we see in March we have to do a lot more to get where we want to do, where we want to really be. Uh, maybe we should just put off that thought uh, until March because uh, I don't want to be asking people, having been through a lot of campaigns, you don't want to ask for somebody something in, in November and then the next June say, hey, we just want to really, we really wanted more. Um, that's my opinion. I think we ought to ask once for whatever we want to do big time. So in March, to answer the last question first, in March we'll have the fully baked plan that has been vetted by the public and the board. Uh, for where Metro, where we see ourselves in two, in 2024 uh, and two to four years beyond that. Um, it's it's going to present that future, what we would do if we had more resources. What we're going to finish this year uh, by May, uh, July, uh, June with implementation in, in November, uh, December is what we can do with our current resources. So. We'll be, we'll be done. We'll be done by March, and we'll have already talked to the public through various rounds of outreach on what the future of Metro could look like if we have additional resources. Our target, to go back to the first question, is certainly 15 minutes as a baseline. Um, it's, it's kind of a minimum uh, level of convenience for people, right? It's also important uh, for state funding now. You know, a lot of the cities uh, are interested in where we're gonna put these 15 minute corridors, because it means it's gonna be easier to develop along those corridors given recent changes in state legislation. So 15 minutes is our target. You know, we're not gonna be able to get there in a lot of places until we have additional resources uh, operationally to do that. Budget-wise, we're gonna be balancing the whole system. So obviously if we have 30 and 60 minute routes currently and we wanna do a 15 minute corridor, it's gonna mean reducing somewhere else given our existing resources. And that's why the the future scenarios are much more exciting to talk about because it's, it's adding. It's adding resources where we can kind of maintain the existing level, make sure that it's the best it can be, 
and then adding on top of it to build these 15 minute corridors in the future that we've heard overwhelmingly from the public that people want to be able to use and rely on, on Metro uh, within Santa Cruz County. Thank you, Director Rodkin. Yeah, Go for it. Uh, Dan had a, yeah. I, I wanna second everything John just said and I wanna add two things to that. One is just to, about the cost factor, just the cost of running a bus is on a day-to-day -day is basically the cost of having a driver out there and, uh, and the driver and the bus itself. Um, and when you double the frequency, you double the number of buses you need and so you double the cost. That's just how that works. There's a, sometimes there's some, there, there's some rounding in that, but that's basically, that's basically how that works out. Um, the, the other one thing I wanna talk about is you asked about the adequate frequency and I think that John's absolutely right, 15 minutes is the, is the general target and it's the state, um, it's certainly the target that the state of California is encouraging everyone to think about right now. I wanna add another point of context which is that the frequency that becomes useful where you get that kind of next level depends on the distance of the trip. So um, I think, you know, in, so if you have very long trips, like you could get a lot by increasing, you know, service to Salinas being every 30 minutes versus every 60 minutes, I think actually has a fair amount of potential. Um, but that obviously wouldn't be a huge improvement for, uh, you know, someone trying to get between Live Oak and the city of Santa Cruz. It's still a long amount of time to wait compared to the amount of time you're on the bus. Uh, for your shorter services with very high demand, like between um, downtown Santa Cruz um, and the university, you know, you could consider, uh, you, you get that benefit, you know, you get some of it at 15, but you'll get more of it at every 10 if you can, if you can afford that. So. First of all, I wanted to agree with uh, Bruce McPherson. Um, it, it's a little, we wanna make sure that we, we're in a position to like figure out how much money do we need the public will support um, one time in losing to Verizon in the future rather than ask for half of it and then try and come back and lose the other, the other one time. Um, I do want to point out that um, our, our service levels have degraded for a very real financial reason. In, 19, in 2016, we, we had a 25% budget cut in this agency and we only cut 12% of the service, which was, I thought, our staff deserved even more, the staff then deserve a lot of credit for having, you know, not have to make 25% cuts in the service, even though the money went down that much. But nonetheless, that, that's a real hit. And it's a little early to start the campaign for this tax measure, whatever it's gonna be, but let's face it, if we don't pass some kind of a tax measure, I don't know if it's a sales tax and I don't know what it is and how much it is, then, you know, there's a lot of planning exercise that's, as was pointed out, gonna be kind of marginal. It'll be, it's still worth doing some of it and be marginally helpful, but it's not gonna be what the public are asking for. It's gonna cost money and we have to go out there and fight for the public to support that and then to be able to drive the service that they wanna have. And that was the situation we found ourselves in um, 1978 when we passed measure G for the half cent sales tax and it's gonna be our situation again. And um, so again, we, we shouldn't be fooling ourselves early on that, the reason really we shouldn't be fooling ourselves that you know we're going to somehow like improve the system tremendously through a organized planning effort without more funding. It's about more funding, and you know if, if, you, if a 15-minute route costs twice what a 30-minute route costs, that's money, plain and simple. Um, and so, I, I think the reason we're doing the what can we get for our current money, it's part of the, frankly, the political effort to show people that you know okay, we're, we're not trying to just throw money at stuff. We want to study it and see what goes on. So this is what you get if we don't raise the funds and people can look at that and realize it's not what they're looking for. And that might be another incentive to get people to come out and actually support a, a better transit system, both for the people that are going to ride it, but also the people that don't want to be stuck in traffic and hope that a lot of other people get out their cars. I mean, whatever it is that motivates people to vote for these things. But it, it, we do need more money. And I think that's realistic and we're not just, you know, asking for money because that's just what government does with something that other agencies do. It's because we really need it. And that 25% cut, that that hurt us badly. Uh, we, we, when we passed that half cent sales tax in 78, we're one of the first districts in the country to do something like that. Um, you know, certainly in a small community, big
Twin Cities will be one of the communities of our size, not so much. And um, we need to get back to that kind of thinking again. And particularly in a community that's got the environmental awareness that ours has, if we want to cut back on greenhouse gases, I mean, there's fights about this. Is it 40 or 60 percent of the greenhouse gases coming from transportation? But it's somewhere in that range, and that is not insignificant. So people want to do more than talk about climate change. They need to think seriously about that and get some money to make this thing work. Just, just attack what comment on, you know, our surveys in the last fall showed strong support among non-riders for maintaining Metro. And that's kind of your first point there is how do we maintain the system into the future and stop some of the things that we've heard during this initial round of outreach that the system has really started to atrophy over, over recent years directly related to funding. So that's, that's the first goal, maintain the system in the best state possible. Thank you, Jacqueline. And just a couple um, points I think are positives for us. As Director Eichler mentioned, we do have the articulated buses coming in that will certainly help UCSC when you have that extra 20 feet. Um, and the other is the driver recruitment. And that's part of the issue is the shortage of drivers. And I know there's been some success in this, this approach too. I'm looking forward to those new drivers coming in, going into what I think of as academy as a police officer, but uh, whatever that, that uh, term is. So there are some positives with these these buses coming in from San Diego and um, you know the recruitment efforts that at least should help the public see some of these improvements and be more supportive of of a funding you know ask too. Thank you. Let me see if there's any members of the public that would like to comment on this. Mr. Sandoval. Well, first, I just want to thank you for the great presentation, Daniel. Um, I just want to share my quick experience of whenever I travel, I try to rely on transportation, or at least when I'm there, just to see what the experience is like in other places in the U.S. And uh, specifically in San Francisco, um, I was relying on the buses, and I missed a bus. And knowing how our system is designed, I didn't think another one's going to show up for a couple hours, you know, or how reliable it is. And uh, within 15 minutes, another route came by. And that is exactly where we need to be, is where you could go to a bus stop or even miss a bus stop or bus and, and know that you're going to be picked up in 15 minutes to go where you're going to need to go. Um, that's where I'm really hoping we're going to be able to go to. I will emphasize that I'm glad Donna Lynn brought it up. We do have a driver shortage, an extreme driver shortage. Um, we're not even providing a reliable service right now because we are dropping routes. And I encourage everybody in this room or online to sign up for our Gov deliveries so you could see when we drop routes. Um, and I just am really hoping that we could get to a place where we could provide reliable, uh, frequent transportation. And um, just emphasize again, too, the pattern for a while now has been that we're losing people faster than we're bringing them in. And we have a great opportunity coming up with our contract negotiations to reach a deal where we could attract new drivers and retain the ones that we currently have. So thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public? I don't see anyone online. Okay, thank you so much for the work and the presentation. We'll move on to item 18, which is CEO oral report. All right. I appreciate the opportunity just to chat for just a few minutes before we go into closed session about uh, some of the, the, the current uh, undergoings at the agency. But I would have to stop for just a second to regress and talk just a bit about Reimagine Metro from your CEO perspective. I think uh, Director Koenig made a really good point. You know, transit works in Boulder because it's a hop, skip, and a jump. It is easy to understand, it is frequent, it is fast, and it is reliable. And if you were to ask me, looking at what we looked at down in Watsonville, I would call those routes estimate, study, guess, good luck. <laughs> I mean, it is going to take till March to come up with something that is as simple as hop, skip, and a jump to make this work. I think is, a, is problematic. It's not that hard. Uh, I think you have a fiscal cliff coming up that we'll be talking more about. 
which means you're going to be cutting more service before you get to a ballot if you aren't seriously considering a ballot opportunity in 24. And I think it's going to be easy to see that uh, the public, the majority of the public that goes into a voting booth doesn't ride your bus system and never will, but they recognize the value of the service that you provide and they recognize that you need an easy to understand, frequent, useful bus system that's, that's improved over what you have today to be able to give people equity and opportunity in, 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 in Santa Cruz County. So those are my thoughts going out of that conversation. So they are what they're worth. And uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation moving forward. Um, I do want to say there are some pretty amazing things going on. And you've, you've made mention to them and alluded to them throughout the meeting. But your ridership continues to grow. Uh, but I thought I'd point out two things. I asked our planning department, is there any service we're providing that is 2019 level in pre-COVID? And interestingly enough, you provide uh, pre-COVID-like service on the weekends. So I asked, what's, your, what's our ridership on the weekends compared to 2019, knowing that we're providing that level of service? And it's up 15.5%. So people are returning to transit they have a willingness and appetite too, and it's growing. Um, second, the, uh, the other bullet point I asked was, what's going on with youth, youth cruise tourism? We've now been running it for a while. So um, youth cruise free is up 96% in, in, in student ridership, K through 12. So that's the impact of creating something that's easy to use and uh, and the, you know, the reciprocal uh, ridership that comes from it. I think it's a great note and comment and story for Sacramento. And it's a great comment and story for the community and for the school districts. It's a pilot and the whole purpose was to gauge how the students will react. And I think you've seen how they're reacting. We haven't even gone on campus yet to set up uh, booths and to really get them engaged. And so I'm excited to see where that ridership goes with that. Um, I do want to, I know we're, we've been in here for hours, um, but I got like two or the three other things. That uh, flood event when the levee broke in Watsonville, I just want you to know I was really proud to be from Metro when that happened. Um, we got a call from the mayor Saturday night. Hey, I've got all kinds of people coming to the fairgrounds. I need some help. And so I called um, James. James Sandoval, sorry about that, I need some help with this. You know, he's your, he's your general chair for the Local 23. He called Ignacio Mata, which is your president for uh, SMART, the, your Local 23. And within a couple of hours, our teams were delivering blankets, towels, toiletries that included toothpaste, toothbrushes, diapers for uh, infants, coloring books, crayons for uh, children. I mean, man, to have that happen on a weekend with just a couple of hours of notice, I just felt like, uh, I just felt like uh, I was just, you know, over the moon with saying I work for Metro and I'm part of that family. So there, there's lots of other things that happen there. Uh, I just want to mention that immediately, you know, uh, or within days, Rena, your uh, manager of customer service, trying to remember her last name, Solario. Uh, she made the fantastic suggestion, let's get 200 passes over there, uh, basically a 15-day custom pass made for the people at the fairground so they can actually get out and have some mobility. And so in the end, we provided 272 uh, passes that have a value of 15 days of all you can ride on them. And, uh, and then Margo went to action and customized Route 79 so that it had regular service during the day uh, so that they could actually have uh, access to the bus system from the fairgrounds. So, I mean, when you say that Metro does far more than just run in circles with the routes, uh, man, they do. And I'm really proud of them. And even our drivers were at loss in regard to their homes. And you saw in the newspaper how our employees reacted to that to get them the resources they needed. 
Um, I do want to say uh, perhaps just one or two other things. We, we have five drivers that are just being released, another uh, th that are just starting their revenue service, six that are in the classroom. Uh, Eduardo Montesino, uh, you know him as the mayor of Watsonville. I know him as Supervisor Montesino with our organization, but he and um, a, f a fellow supervisor, Araceli Campos, put together a game plan to take our classroom training and our behind the wheel training from four classroom uh, cycles to nine during the year. And then we've got ongoing recruitment that's coming up soon. Margo's working day and night to try and figure out how to make good on doing nine classes a year. So the big goal and the one that I'm losing sleep over the most because it's just important and I don't want anything to fall through the cracks is by the end of 23, you're running uh, with full staff. The, the 20 drivers, being being short 20 drivers is, is a thing of the past uh, at the end of the year. I think you're going to get there perhaps earlier than that. I mean, last Sunday I get a call from one of our operators and uh, we go out and walk the street on Sunday afternoon, basically in the rain, talking to people uh, about uh, becoming a, an operator at Metro and three applications come in Monday just off that operator being out on Sunday in the rain talking to people. So there's just a lot of focus and I'm, you know, I'm happy to, that, it, that uh, it's happening. Um, CHP came to town, did their annual inspection. I think it's important for the board to know what the CHP thought of Metro. Uh, they come in and do a random inspection, meaning they just tell you they're gonna show up on Tuesday and have the buses ready to be looked at. So uh, yesterday they finished up that annual inspection. They gave you the highest rating they could. Sounds kind of lame, but it's a satisfactory. <laughs> but I want you to know you've had some of the best mechanics at the CHP, obviously, who are concerned about safety. Look at your buses, look at your driver records, look at your training programs, and so on, and give you the highest rating they've got. Um, and then finally, um, Oh, yeah, yeah. In April, we're going to start a community police project. We've got community partners that can do one right at a time. There's other projects now where the mailing list is probably 10,000. It's substantial. Um, Senator Laird said the best advice I could ever give you is he said this is a great agency. You've got the best public trust with what you're doing. Um, this is just great for the city. So we'll do a, a once a month community newsletter and then us asking for your once a week internal correspondence from city employees to keep me up to speed on, on what's going on and so that uh, mechanism when you get back to me you might comment on it and so on as well so it's kind of interesting you know our mutual dialogue and kind of ongoing communication uh, with the agency so with that uh, you know I'd be happy to answer any questions um, Director McPherson we met with the CEO at uh, Community uh, Coast Energy, or Community Central Coast Community Energy, excuse me. And uh, so we're working on a, a template that they would like to use that can go out to other agencies with how uh, they can participate in a fuel energy bus program. So right around the corner, we should be talking about a bus that goes right to the uh, Central Coast Base and then gets to the West on its way. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for that report. Any comments from directors? I just want to say a few things. Okay, um, I Director Ducha. Yeah, thank you. I just want to say uh, thank you, Michael, for you know all your hard work. I, you definitely um, have come come in and really brought some really positive changes to um, our organization. And um, I think that it's it's going to really um, you know, change how we look in the long run um, for for in the positive. So I just want to say thank you for all your hard work. I also want to say <clears throat> thank you to all the bus drivers who um, stepped up, you know, during the flooding down here in South County. Um, we really appreciate it. I mean, it's, I mean, our, our shelter is, is full at the fairgrounds. Um, we have, uh, you know, people that have been just lost everything. And um, it's heartbreaking to see these families um, in the situation um, that they are. And, you know, I was just reading an article today where, you know, kids are afraid to even go back to school. And 
Um, they don't even know if the numbers um, of kids will, will if, if the kids will return. So um, I do want to say, you know, our bus drivers have always stepped up for um, our community um, whenever we asked of them. So I want to say a, a big thank you to them as well. And I guess my question to you, Michael, and you touched on this um, a bit is, and I know we've been working on it, is how do we become more appealing to people to apply to be one of our drivers, to join our family? I mean, I feel like um, we've been having this conversation. We, you know, brought some, the starting rate up. And um, why do you think that we, are, are people just... They don't want to get a, they don't want to be a driver and be accosted by other people on the buses so they choose a different um profession or what what do you think we could do to get our numbers up so that we can get our routes back so that we can get our frequencies up um you know you have a good starting wage you have industry leading benefits and interestingly enough, I, I think the way you um, you make the difference in getting your your new operators, your recruitment, it's not about blasting out TV ads. It's not about blasting out radio ads. It's about um, it's about people talking to people. And most of the people that we talked to, for instance, last Sunday in the rain, um, who was I got this driver's name, his last name, Johnny Lopez. Um, the people we talked to said, oh my gosh, there must be a waiting list. It must take you a year to get on board at Metro. And I'm like, are you kidding me, right? <laughs> but believe it or not, I heard that multiple times during the day. Um, so I got the, we got this stuff all over the radio. We got it on social media ads. But, you know, when you just go out and you talk to people, what we're really finding is... Um, that uh, you know, at the end of the day, people are underemployed, and that's the target market. It's your underemployed. It's the people making twenty-one bucks an hour with minimal benefits. Who would love to make twenty-four bucks an hour with industry-leading benefits? And uh, we'll continue to mass market that. I'm not saying we're going to stop mass marketing it, but I think the most productive way we get uh, operators in is when everybody starts talking about with their friends and with the people that they meet in, in the grocery store, at the fast food restaurant, uh, wherever you may be, it's, it's just talking to them about how great Metro is and that there's a need right now that they apply and just uh, helping them get the, the recruitment. And, and uh, that's the best tool ever is these business cards that have the information because you can have a simple conversation and hand someone a card and it's an easy application to make. Um, that's been the most productive. That's the target market. It's not necessarily the unemployed. It's the underemployed. Those are the folks that would love to have what our operators have and, uh, and be a part of an organization that's as tight and family oriented as Metro. Have you thought of maybe like a refer a friend? You know, if you, when you think of, you know, you, sometimes you see, I don't know, gyms or, um, banks, you know, and and maybe that would give it um an um it would incentivize our employees to you know go out to their friends and their families and um you know if the person comes on as full time then that employee gets that stipend or whatever we give out I mean that might be helpful if, if that's where we're heading with with this is to you know word of mouth I think you know maybe we do some sort of incentive incentive incentivizing them I, I think Just it all works the mass media works to an extent, but I've really just found that if you really want to get people in the door, the more people are talking to, connecting with neighbors and friends and people that they meet. Um, I mean, I, I walk from the downtown transit center to my office during the week. I'm passing a guy in the street I've never seen before. I stop him and I say, where do you work? And he looks at me like I'm an alien. And uh, he said, I work at the library. And I said, well, how come you're not working for Metro? Because you're obviously walking in the neighborhood where Metro lives as far as where we keep the buses and where the operators are. And he's like, well, again, I thought there was a long waiting list. And uh, I've seen your flyer at the library, by the way. But I just have never really connected the dots. And I, we had a five-minute conversation. And I would bet that guy's got an application. And I'm paying more than the library's paying him. I have better benefits. 
and the transit system is right where you live. So, you know, unless you stop somebody and you say hi to them, you're gonna, never going to make that connection. Thank you. I think the public also needs to know more about the, the nature of the job. Um, I was shocked to learn when I discovered that the reason people don't make it through our training program, in the vast majority of cases, it's not because they can't train how to drive a bus. And that's probably most people's fear. How, boy, that's a big thing. I don't know if I could drive that. And I'm, you know, I don't think of myself as a physical person or whatever. But the reason people don't make it through our training program is mainly because we can't train. It's hard to train people in customer service. Um, and in fact, this is a much safer place to drive a bus than in our cities. Um, it's not a it's scary a job, I think, as some people think it might be. Um, we also, um, we don't, of our bus drivers, they, they do have to interact with the public, but it's not at the level that sort of like I think is threatening to people. So just making people understand that, that people, almost any, not everybody, almost anybody can be trained to drive a bus. They just need to have a positive attitude towards working with the public. And, and like you said, there's a short waiting list for them. It pays pretty well, and the benefits are fantastic. So that message is not out there yet to the level that it needs to be in the general public. And so I, I do think along with the one-on-one -on -one contact, just sending stuff out there about what, what, you know, what does it mean to be a bus driver. Just saying we're hiring bus drivers is probably intimidating as a job for a lot of people that it shouldn't be intimidating. Thank you. I just wanted to, I'm Don Cremay, HR Director. I wanted to address Jimmy's uh, comment about uh, refer a friend. We are currently running a referral bonus for the bus operator position. So if anybody, any of our current employees refer somebody, um, it's a 2000 or up to $2,000 uh, referral bonus paid out over two years. So it pays out just like the sign-on bonus of $4,000 that we're offering right now. So I just I wanted to make sure everybody knew that. Thank you. Thank you. Just curious, uh, do you do an exit interview with anybody who starts the process and then stops midstream uh, to get feedback as to, okay, you started this, now it's not, doesn't seem to be working for you. What, why is it no longer appealing? And getting that sort of, because that'll, get, I don't, maybe you're doing it, but do you get any sort of feedback from those folks that start and just don't complete it? We do, and you know, Don can elaborate, but um, we're very interested when Do uh, an exit interview each time if the exiting employee will allow us to. Sometimes they don't want to do that. Um, we do gather that information, and if if it's um, something that that we can pass on, we do pass on to whichever manager it pertains to. Yeah. Um, just real quick, I know we want to get out of here, but um, I just wanted to give Michael credit for that call that he made on that weekend uh, to activate Ignacio Mata. Pretty much he connected me, and um, we just wanted to make sure to take care of as many people as we could, and we were able to do that as a team. I also wanted to give Don and Michael also credit because we're attacking this recruitment and retention problem. We're meeting twice a week, coming up with a lot of different ideas and strategies on how to address this, and we're working extremely well as a team. And um, just, uh, I'm trying to remember the last point that I was going to make. Oh, I apologize in advance because I did not send my invitation to you guys. I normally do, but we normally have that quarterly bid change party that you're probably aware of, where we provide food for Metro employees. And uh, we just recently had one, and we usually ask for donations to kind of make up for the food that we bought. But this time, we provided the donations to our Metro employees that were currently affected. I mean affected, when I mean affected, like bad, you know, their house is underwater. So um, I will be uh, happy to report that we raised almost $3,000 and we were able to distribute it evenly amongst them. And the amount of gratitude from each and every person was awesome. And it's just validating and proving that Metro is a family. And I just wanted to make sure you guys knew about that. Thank you. Um, and thank you and congratulations. That's a lot of milestones and accomplishments in the last month. So thank you for that report. We'll move on to item 19, and that's review of items to be discussed in closed session. Um, we'll go to general counsel and Director Smith-Holwick. 
Thank you. The board will meet in closed session, conference with legal counsel, existing litigation as described in the agenda. Now is the time for any public comment, and if not, the board will meet in closed session and then reconvene o open session at 10 p.m. Thank you. We take public comment now. Seeing none, we'll recess for closed session and come back after.